well, thank you all for coming back. Uh, so this is probably the most um, dense hour that we're gonna have as far as information. Um, and I'm pleased to announce that we have our, to kick us off, we've got Katie McCormick. She's the residential horticulture agent and master gardener coordinator in Seminole County in um, the town of Sanford. And so it's just north of Orlando. They've got a great uh, growing season there and she is quite an expert at uh, growing vegetable gardens and raised beds. And they've got a wonderful demonstration garden just behind their auditorium. So if you ever have an opportunity to go there, be sure to check out their, um, their demo garden. So Katie, you can take it away. All right. So I went ahead and just kind of edited for time the thing that I usually give to our school garden dividends when I do school garden dividends training for school gardens uh, and made it a little bit more raised bed centric. So we'll be covering location, construction, soil management, uh, watering, uh, growing seasons, although I am afraid this is gonna be a little bit more Central Florida centric for growing seasons. I'll discuss it a little bit for others. Uh, crop selection, seeds and transplants, managing pests, and then expectations and setting them for yourself and the groups you're working with. So first for garden location, we kind of covered this in a couple of the earlier talks. You wanna make sure that it has convenient access. It needs to be well-drained. Um, one of the sites I went to, they told me that where they wanted to put their gardens was gonna flood for part of the year. And I said, well, we can't really do your garden here. Uh, it should be near a source of water where you can actually water this garden. Another garden I went to, you had to walk across a parking lot to get to the closest hose spigot. And I was like, are we gonna do like a bucket line to water your vegetable garden? No, <laughs> so it needs to be near a water source. Uh, at least six hours direct sunlight daily if you're growing anything that's going to produce fruits. You can get away with a shadier location if you're growing greens. It needs to be far from large trees because those roots can get up into the beds and start robbing water and nutrients from your vegetables. Uh, if possible, you should be rotating the location that you're planting things every year, so different plants and different beds. Um, some gardeners, I do in particular incorporate vegetables into landscape plantings as well. So if you've got a little butterfly garden near your raised bed garden, you could do that. Uh, and we'll be talking a lot about the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide throughout this. So for our raised bed construction, uh, size, the standard for most of our raised beds that you're gonna see in school gardens, at least the ones that we interact with, are gonna be like four by eight feet. And typically there's 16 to 24 inch depth for best growth. Um, you wanna leave 18 to 24 inches between the beds as well, because it's hard to kneel on the ground if there isn't a lot of space between the beds to kneel in. Uh, and you gotta kneel down to do some weeding and planting and sometimes some watering. Uh, taller and deeper beds are gonna require more material, materials, but will require less bending. And there are guides out there for also constructing ADA compliant beds to make it easier for people in a wheelchair to access them. So if that's something that you're concerned about in your school gardens, those resources are out there as well. Uh, you can see a couple of different types of raised beds in the picture here. Uh, the first one, they've gone ahead and created bench seating around it. This one's a little taller as well. So you have uh, less bending to do when accessing it. Beside that, we've got one that's up and raised off of the ground on some concrete blocks, um, which again, allows you to have less bending and probably a little less weeding as well because weed seeds are gonna have a harder time getting up in there. Uh, third beds, these are actually at our extension office here in Sanford. This was two Februarys ago. We grow all these vegetables for our yearly expo. Um, and these were done out of metal uh, instead of wood. So you can see the metal bed, bed on the edge there. Problem with the metal is it does eventually start rusting. That powder cup coating uh, rubs off. And then the final ones, these are actually those ones that were across the parking lot. This was an Eagle Scout project at one of our uh, school locations and uh, they never put any soil in them or watered them because there was just no way to actually get water out to them without crossing a parking lot. Uh, again, for our raised bed construction, you can use a lot of different materials. Um, you can use stones, bricks, uh, concrete blocks, synthetic wood, wood. Uh, you saw our metal beds that we have here at the extension office. If you're using wood, you wanna use ACQ ground contact treated lumber. Uh, that is approved by the FDA for food production and it contains copper preservatives and copper is one of the things that plants use as a nutrient, although it can be toxic at really high levels. Um, but that'll keep it from breaking down too quickly, considering we live in Florida and it's super wet and hot most of the year. Uh, wood can degrade very quickly in the garden. 
You want to avoid railroad ties and old pressure treated lumber from before 2004, particularly for that old pressure treated lumber, they might have used methyl bromide or they might have used arsenic. So we don't want to use either of those for something that we're going to grow food in. If weeds were formerly a problem in this site, or if you're putting this on top of the grass, like in that last picture on the last slide, you might want to consider adding a weed barrier, uh, which you can use uh, four or five layers of newspaper, or you can add um, cardboard in a couple layers before you pr start putting your soil down. And that'll just keep the weeds from coming up in your bed and keep you from having weed problems immediately. Uh, one of the community gardens that we partnered with didn't do that before we came on board and now they're dealing with turf coming up in their vegetable garden beds because they just plopped them down on the turf. So that is something that you want to mitigate before you start gardening, either digging up all of the grass and sod and weeds in the area or putting down a layer of newspaper or cardboard to shade them out. So once the beds are constructed, and again, you can find a lot of guides on this construction online. In the background of this uh, particular slide, you can see one that's talking about putting in the posts and the size of the wood. Um, IFAS has a really good raised bed document that goes into all of this, but once they're built either out of wood or concrete blocks or bricks or whatever material you're using, you will need to find soil. So for our soil and nutrition program, for soil management, um, you wanna have good organic material going into these beds and where you find that organic material is gonna vary and the price is gonna vary a lot too. So for our beds here in Seminole County, I go through a local guy that just sells compost. Um, he's out in Geneva, which is more farming area here in Seminole County. And for him to bring us a load of compost, it's $25 a yard. Uh, a yard is 27 cubic feet. So typically we're buying a couple yards to refill our beds every year. Um, he's pretty cheap for compost. So going from that to trying to buy stuff in bags, if you go to the store and find something like black cow or garden soil, it's gonna be more expensive to buy that bagged stuff as opposed to finding somebody who can drop off a load of compost for you. Uh, if you wanna make your own compost, that can be a whole nother project at your school garden. Um, and there are definitely good documents on how to do composting. Um, but at the end of the day, the real thing is that we don't want to use our native sand. Uh, native Florida sand doesn't hold on to nutrients well. It doesn't hold on to water really well. And if we're going to do a raised bed, the whole point of a raised bed is you get to control the kind of soil that you're putting in it. So you want good composted material whenever you're uh, creating these raised beds. And then for your fertilizer, um, you want to use a balanced slow release fertilizer incorporated in the top six inches of that garden compost that you've put in. Um, this can be organic and can be synthetic. Uh, synthetic fertilizers are going to last longer in the soil generally than organic, um, but you can use either or. It's just a matter of preference for the garden set you're using. Synthetic will be cheaper. Uh, and again, cost and availability are going to vary greatly by region. Uh, also, if you're wanting to create your own composted uh, soil for your vegetable garden, you might be dealing with something like well-rotted compost that you've created yourself. Uh, sometimes you can buy pine bark. Sometimes you can buy composted manures or peat moss, perlite or vermiculite. All of those can be used. Um, when you're putting the soil in initially, you want it to be about two inches taller than your actual bed because uh, that's going to sink down and settle over time, usually to either the top of the bed or a little under. So it may seem like a lot of soil when you're first putting it in, but eventually it'll settle out. This can be the most time consuming and expensive element of a new vegetable garden. Although with the price of wood, what it is right now, the wood might be the most expensive component at the moment. Uh, but soil is usually gonna be up there for the pricing out of things, just because you're usually having to put a big investment into it at the beginning. Uh, once you have soil in your garden, it does break down over time if you're using this organic material. So you're probably gonna need to top up every year or two. Watering and irrigation. So like I said, uh, one of the things you really need to keep in mind when you're siting where you're gonna put this particular vegetable garden is where's the water actually gonna come from for it? Is there an irrigation system nearby? Uh, how are you gonna supplement the watering? Typically, Central Florida and a lot of Florida, our rainfall is the lowest during most of the vegetable production season. And sometimes we're even in drought. Uh, for the last two months, we've been really dry here in Central Florida. So you're going to need to supplement water because the rainfall isn't here in the cool season when a lot of our vegetables are growing. Um, 
So making sure that you have a convenient source of water is really important for the chance of your success here. I do for our gardens here, um, micro irrigation systems in our gardens. So we have little micro head sprayers and an irrigation timer to our vegetable garden here at the extension office because I'm not available to go out there every day and water and none of my volunteers wanna come in every day and water everything. And especially at the beginning, whenever you're doing uh, small seedlings or your seeds, you need to have really, really regular water. Um, automated irrigation systems, like I said, can be helpful, especially if you've got a larger garden. And the amount of water is gonna vary with the crop, how old those plants are, how hot it is, how much rainfall we're getting, um, what the soil is like, and if you've mulched around the area. So watering both over and under watering are probably the biggest issues that I see with all of our school gardens and community gardens. People either water too much and they drown their plants or they water too little and they dry out. Uh, for vegetable gardening, I would say a lot of times it's hard to water too much, especially in these raised beds because the drainage is usually pretty good in them, but it's possible. For our growing seasons, um, you want to observe the pl crop planting dates in table one of the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. We have three crop growing periods here in Central Florida, um, North and South Florida are going to be a little bit off from my dates here. Um, but for our growing seasons, whenever you're starting a vegetable garden, your goal should be to complete your site preparation about two weeks prior to your er earliest planned planting date. This will give you time to work out any kinks, uh, especially if you're doing irrigation, it will get you time to make sure your irrigation is working properly and your timer is set properly and not over or under watering and none of your spray heads are clogged. Um, just getting it ready before you have to actually put those plants in gives you time to do some extra planning. Here's just our Florida vegetable gardening guide uh, table one, which tells you those planting dates. So you can see I went ahead and just picked out bush beans uh, in Central Florida for my example here. You can see we can plant those February through April, August through September. A um, little earlier in, or a little later in North Florida and uh, just the September through April for South Florida for beans. And all of them are, most of our crops can be found on these planting dates in Florida for our common vegetable gardening crops. And uh, you can tell when you're supposed to be planting them based off of this. For the selection, um, the cultivar matters or the cultivated variety. So in that same Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide, Table 2 goes over the cultivars that grow well in Florida and have been tested by University of Florida. You can also talk to friends or garden club people or master gardeners to determine which vegetable seeds and cultivars have grown well for them. Um, heirloom varieties are often touted as being really great and some of them work and some of them don't because some of them are heirlooms from Florida and some of them are heirlooms from Ohio that grandma brought with her, right? So it's a good idea, especially if you're going to be going back to this garden year by year to have somebody keeping a journal of the results of the different crops that you've grown and see what varieties work in that particular space. Some of them may work better for you than others. If a favorite variety from somewhere else fails, you can try changing the planting month or location or try it in a container instead. Uh, we do lavender only in containers here at our extension office because it just doesn't grow in our beds well. And generally you're gonna be able to find a wider variety of seeds than you will local transplants. So uh, usually when you go to the hardware store, you're gonna find plants um, only one or two varieties of, of different types of plants. Whereas if you order from a seed catalog, you have hundreds of varieties to choose from. Um, so you can find a lot, a lot more available in seed form. And you can see this is our table two of that vegetable gardening guide I was talking about. So again, looking at beans, uh, for snap and shell beans, they have two different, or two different types that they're available. Uh, and you can look at the different varieties that they recommend. They also offer some extra notes or remarks for all of these crops as well. So any extra information they have on planting, it goes into there. For our transplants and seeds, um, make sure they're high quality. So use seeds that were packaged for this year. Transplants should be well-developed. You should have really nice, fat, thick stalks on them. They shouldn't be stringy and stretched out. That means they didn't get enough sunlight. And then also consider the transplantability guide in table one of that Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. Um, if you're going to start seeds indoors and nurture them to the point that they're transplants for outdoors, that's going to take more time. Um, some seeds can be treated, which we discovered today with our rye seeds. So consider that seed treatment as well whenever you're dealing with seeds and when you're dealing with kids and seeds. You can see here 
Again, with our bush beans, they're considered a transplantability of three, which means they don't transplant well. So it's better to plant those directly in the garden, as opposed to something like arugula, which is a one and transplants well into the garden. And for our seed package up at the top, you can see the year that these should be planted. So these are 2016 seeds. Probably these are a little old to be planting now. Uh, also, you have information on planting depth, date of maturity, so when you'll actually be harvesting, uh, and how long it takes to germinate on here. And you have information on where and when to plant. So uh, this tells you how to plant them and uh, to conditions to look for. In Florida, oftentimes the where and when to plant is a little bit different uh, compared to what the, the seed actually says. Then pests and diseases and weeds. So we live in Florida and there are pests, diseases and weeds here all the time. I don't think they ever really slow down much. So make sure that you're taking care of your plants really well. Um, if you only have one or two aphids or one or two caterpillars in your garden, maybe just squish them. Um, learn about what the threshold is for when you actually need to treat with something. You wanna learn to identify specific pests or symptoms. So know what, plant, what bugs like to eat your cabbage or what diseases are going to be on your corn and keep those in mind. Making sure you're out there checking the garden or your garden leaders are out there checking the garden at least once a week to look for pests and diseases is really important. And that's, I think, one of the steps that a lot of our school gardens and community gardens really fail at. Um, you may not need to recommend chem chemicals uh, if needed, although a lot of our vegetable garden pests, if you're keeping up on them, can be treated with just a hose. Um, if you want more information on uh, organic um, sprays that you can use, you can go to that organic vegetable gardening in Florida, which is another IFAS document. Um, there's also a managing the organic garden presentation online for pests and uh, vegetable gardens. These are just some common pests that you might see in your veggie garden. I say aphids are probably the most common followed by caterpillars. Uh, mealy bugs you sometimes see though and spider mites, especially if you've got an area that is really um, well guarded by fences or buildings so you don't get a lot of breeze, uh, you might see spider mites. A common sign of aphids, mealy bugs, um, spider mites, and a white fly would be this black city mold on the leaves. So this grows on their poop. Uh, and if you see the black city mold, there should be insects nearby that need to be treated. And then common diseases you might see, uh, a lot of leaf spotting can be different diseases or anthracnose. Uh, we get mildews on a lot of our cucurbits. Root rots, uh, blossom end fungus is actually, or blossom end rot is usually a calcium deficiency in the soil. So we see that in our solanaceous crops, crops or tomatoes and peppers. And then with the people that you're dealing with in your gardens or in your garden, you should be setting reasonable expectations. So consider your experience level. Maybe don't put in 10 vegetable gardening beds if you've never vegetable gardened before. Or make sure you have somebody that's going to come and help you out and be that content expert whenever you do that. Consider the space available. Consider how much time you have available. Consider if you have materials readily available to work within this garden. And then consider what vegetables are gonna be easy to eat, especially if we're dealing with kids in these gardens that maybe you just want things that they can pick a leaf off and eat immediately, as opposed to something that maybe is gonna taste better whenever it's cooked. And then consider the budget for the garden project and well, as well and work within those confines. One of the things that we did in Seminole County to help with managing expectations is we made a month by month vegetable gardening guide for our teachers. And it breaks down uh, in time how much time they should be spending each month in their garden at the minimum. So you can see here um, for the month of August, they're spending at least nine hours, 45 minutes in their garden total for the month. And that's because August is mostly just prep work. I think that next month, September, we've got something like 18 hours in the garden. So this is like a part-time job if it's only one person doing it. And then uh, to recap, you want to consider location, our growing seasons, uh, soil management and plant nutrition, crop selection, the seeds, supplemental watering and irrigation, uh, those pests that might show up. You want to consider the reasonable expectations and I'll take any questions. Pat, you liked my... Uh, wow, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. I was told um, to do this in 20 minutes and I'm really proud of myself. Really and she nailed it. That. She nailed it. <laughs> yeah. 
that's a lot. I'm a veggie grower also, but man, to see it all laid out like that, bam, it was, um, geez. So you can use pressure treated wood, but it has to be after 2004. So if you buy it at the store, it's okay. Yeah, just don't use like random lumber from your backyard. <laughs> right, right. No railroad ties. Yeah. So um, also, I need to look for a source in, in our county for compost. Like we have chicken chicken uh, farmers out in Indian Town, mm -hmm. and you know I know chicken poop is one of the best things we could use, but um, you I think you have to go out and get it. So you probably would have to take a pickup. Now that would be mm -hmm. acceptable, right? Yeah, um, and chicken manure, you would have to let it compost for a while because it runs pretty hot. Well, it's already composted. Yeah, then if you have pickup. The, the other place that people will get it here in Central Florida is from um, Zellwood Mushrooms, the mushroom place in Zellwood. But you have to oh. take your truck out there and they'll just load it up. It's used mushroom. Oh, we'll see. I'm located. We're located in South Florida. Yeah. Big so difference. You got to find your contacts. For me, um, yeah, I'll go look into that. that. The guy Thank that we use comes to our yearly expo. So that's how I learned about him. <laughs> okay, for the sake of time, because we really have to be ending at two o'clock. So we're gonna try to do our best here. Um, we will get this, uh, Katie, will you share this calendar um, yeah. that you created? Yeah, I'll um, put it into the chat. Okay, put it in the chat and then maybe send it to me also separately so I can get it out to the participants. Okay. And um, Judy, if you'll go ahead and share screen, um, we can get going with your awesome presentation. All right, now I got to figure this out. Here we go. Katie, thank you so much. Excellent job. We appreciate it. Okay, let's. Uh, it's working it yeah but we can view show mm -hmm. your uh the little button up top that the presenter view or the presentation or or click that or click that screen that you're trying to there you go okay i think are you okay. i not hold on let's go to the display settings then Good. What are you seeing? Are you seeing my presentation? We're seeing the notes, the notes presentation. All right, hold on. I don't know how to do this. Okay. I just switched it before though. If you go up to the display settings. Yep, and drop that down. You should be able to switch it around. Uh, or if you're sharing, if you have a double monitor, you just need to make sure you're sharing uh, the monitor that has the... Yeah, I have a double monitor. How do I switch to the other monitor? Stop Stop sharing your screen and reshare with the monitor that has the uh, full presentation. Okay, now I've lost share screen. No. I did that wrong again. Oh, we see it. It's right. This is what we want to see. You're doing it, Judy. All right. Yay. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes, ma'am. Thank <laughs> Obviously, you. Obviously, I'm not very technologically savvy, y'all. Um, I'm Judy Dampier. I'm a food system specialist with the IFAS Extension Family Nutrition Program. Um, I've been with this program for six years. I've been with UF for 23 prior to my job with family nutrition program. I was a biologist in the agronomy department. I'm going to talk to you about self-watering container gardens for schools. This kind of addresses one of the problems that Katie mentioned, which is water access. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about how they work. They're basically a wicking bed where you have your soil where your plants are located. You have a spout that comes up above the soil line that you can fill 
And down below, you have a water reservoir. This wicking bed basically works on the principle of capillary action. And capillary action uses the ideas of adhesion and cohesion for the water molecules to bind to the soil and basically counteract the principles of gravity and move up through the soil so they're available for the roots. I don't know if they still do it in schools or not, but when I was in school, this was the old celery experiment where you stuck the celery stalk into a cup of colored water and you watch the colored water move up through the xylem. That was capillary action in action. So the idea and the advantage of this is that the water eventually seeps up through the soil, saturating the soil, and it makes the perfect amount of water available to the plant whenever it needs it. This helps sometimes if you want to put plants with different water needs into the same kind of bed, they can each draw out of this self-watering bed the amount of moisture that they need. So this is an example here where I have two different varieties of lettuce in a self-watering container, and they both are very happy with what they need to get for moisture out of the system. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about types of containers. One of them that I use a lot, in fact, I probably just ordered about 15 or 20 of them yesterday, is the Earthbox. Um, as you can see, it's a pretty simple setup. There's the box, there's an overflow drain, the pipe to go ahead and fill, and then a screen to set down in here so that you have a water reservoir underneath your soil. And this is a picture of some pepper plants that I started in an earth box here at the extension office earlier this spring. Another brand is City Pickers. It's the same basic principle. I've never personally used this one, but I would imagine it works somewhat the same. Also, you can do it yourself. Uh, this is a picture of the self-watering system. We have this here at the extension office. It's two five-gallon buckets. We've got a tomato plant growing in there. Um, you can use plastic tubs, plastic soda bottles, big, large water cooler bottles. Um, there's lots of ideas and YouTube videos on how to online. Oh, the places they can go to borrow a little bit from Dr. Zeus. These are some different locations where I've used these self-watering systems. Here's a preschool in Trenton, an after-school club in Madison, a boys and girls club in Taylor County. Here's some that I have at the extension office, and they're also really good at the library. They're good anywhere people may not have the time to constantly check the watering needs of their plants. Advantages on top of the watering is there's minimal assembly, few disease or insect pressures because you're using potting mix. They're really nice in schools and daycares because they're easy for little hands to reach. Sometimes I found that if you're using a four by eight bed, sometimes the middle of it doesn't get used as much because they can't reach in. These allow for a group of kids to gather at the ends and on both sides. They're easily moved if the location that you put them in doesn't turn out to be ideal. One thing I really like about them is they're easily dissembled if no longer being used. I found in lots of school gardens, if you get a new teacher or a new administrator, some of the raised beds that we make or in-ground gardens may no longer be used, become a weedy mess. These guys, you can dump out the soil and they stack up so you have nice compact storage until the next gardener is on site. Disadvantage, some crops may not be feasible. You don't really have a whole lot of room to grow corn and okra and things like that. 
You're gonna have a smaller amount of veggies produced. Um, of course, you can go ahead and circumvent that by having multiple boxes. And they can be a little bit more costly than an in-ground garden or perhaps a raised bed. Earthbox does offer an educator and community garden discount. Um, so I've, I found them to be desirable to use. Um, here's just a few examples of some of the crops that I've had success with in um, the earth boxes container, self-watering container gardens that I use. Um, just as an overall, I pick crops that have a few disease and insect pests. Um, as Katie mentioned, UF IFAS has a lot of great guides as to what to select. Uh, some of the things I've used go along with their guidance, and some of these are just ideas from my personal experience. Lettuce works great in these because lettuce is a water-loving plant. Uh, one of the problems with lettuce is it's really small seeded, so using in a school or preschool garden, it may be difficult to uh, seed it, you can use transplants, or you could consider using seed tape or pelleted seed. Uh, it's nice because it's got a pretty short maturity date of 45 days. The one thing that's not so great about lettuce for school gardens is it doesn't transport well. So if you're planning on sending anything home with the kids, maybe not the best choice. Spinach is another good leafy vegetable. Um, it has a similar maturity of about 40 days and it does transport better than other leafy greens. And it could be used either cooked or raw for your taste tests in your classrooms. Carrots are great. My favorite variety is Danvers, but there's also a couple of mini varieties, one called Adelaide and one Little Finger. They have a shorter day to harvest, so they tend to work better in the school gardens. Day to harvest is about 45 days as opposed to 65 to 70 days for a full-size carrot. They're kind of fun because there's multicolored varieties available. They're great for a taste test out in the garden and they transport well. One of the disadvantages is they can be difficult to thin, so you might want to consider using a seed tape. Broccoli, I was surprised, did really well in here. This is a picture of my broccoli that I grew last winter in the earth box. I was able to get five plants in an earth box and they got to the point of making a full head. Uh, broccoli can be challenging because it's really a cool season, northern kind of crop. Um, and sometimes our winters are getting pretty warm. It also transports well for kids to take home. Some of the warm season crops that I found that do well in these earth boxes are beans. I love beans. I start everybody with beans because beans are relatively disease and insect free. I use the bush types in these boxes so that they don't have to be staked. Um, here again, you can do a whole bunch of different colors. There's velour that's purple, Rook door that's yellow, Blue Lake 274 that's green. These varieties work for me in North Florida. Of course, in South Florida, you want to look for things that are a little bit more heat tolerant. Uh, they're nice for school gardens because the seeds are big. The kids can easily handle them to plant in the earth boxes. They have the short day to maturity and you can have a continuous harvest after the main flush if you choose to. Peppers are another plant that do well in these. Um, these are some banana peppers and some cayenne peppers that came out of my earth boxes. Banana peppers seem to do really, really well in them. And sweet banana peppers are great for the kids to just crunch on in the garden. Once again, you get a variety of colors to make it a little bit more interesting. You're gonna to wanna to avoid hot peppers because if kids are handling the peppers, they don't wanna to be touching their eyes and probably a little too hot for most of them to eat. 
Cucumbers, I had good success with, and here's some seedlings that we planted by seed in one of the earth boxes. I would suggest using a bush or compact variety so you don't have vining all over the place. Um, I tend to use pickling cucumbers because they have a shorter date of maturity and also the skin is thinner so it's a little bit less bitter. You don't have to peel them to snack on them. Uh, one of the problems with cucumbers is they are susceptible to white flies, downy mildew and powdery mildew. So they take a little bit more care and monitoring than some of the other crops I've mentioned. Tomatoes. Everybody wants to grow them. Um, I have people shy away from tomatoes unless they're experienced gardeners, because even for experienced gardeners, they're a challenging crop. You have the new nutritional ish issues that Katie mentioned from lack of calcium and you get blossom end rot. There's lots of diseases like she mentioned, and there's a whole bunch of insect pests. Um, if you are going to use them, I would suggest using bush varieties. Two that I found what, that do well are the husky cherry tomato and the patio tomato, which is a stout bush type tomato that makes, these are some that were grown in a hydroponic system. You can see they're a little bit smaller than a full size tomato, but bigger than your cherry tomato. Uh, they have a longer day to maturity, so definitely use transplants, but the kids really like the cherry and grape tomatoes to harvest in the school gardens. Herbs do great in these boxes. Um, we do basil, cilantro, mint. What's this one? This one's thyme, oregano, rosemary, sage. Um, it's a great place if you want to do a sensory type of garden to grow your herbs. So that's about what I have for gardening in self-watering container gardens. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. I know, and by the way, you made a comment about beans. I know Pat said something about uh, the type of beans that work well down here, but uh, believe it or not, uh, I, I, it with, with the 4 I, I do a lot of school enrichment down here in Palm Beach County. Um, and you would be surprised, black eyed peas from Winn-Dixie, you put them in a, in a bottle and they will sprout like hydroponically and they will sprout within days. Um, and the kids love it because they get to actually see what they're doing. And now, obviously, it's not necessarily a school garden, but just for your future, because I know you were questioning what grows down here in South Florida. So black eyed peas <laughs> do really, really well. Yeah, I'm actually growing some uh, white acres and some zipper peas in my hydroponic system now because they do really well. I'm growing them summertime. And there's also a green bean, I think, called Contender that does well in the South. You just need to look at the EDIS documents to find what's most adapted to the area. Okay, Judy, we've got a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, Michelle Millars is wondering, do you leave your earth boxes uncovered when not in use? No, like I just, I, I don't. I dump the soil and stack them up and put them in my shed. Okay, and, um, and I think Pat Bonish uses, she covers hers with white trash bags. Maybe that's an idea too. Um, and then uh, Julio wants to know about fertilization in these wicking systems. Okay, what I use is I use potting mix. Um, I use potting mix that has fertilizer in it. Um, and I throw in a handful of Osmocote, mix it up, and you can set it and forget it. Um, there's other, other brands. Uh, you can do it organically if you want to, but if you throw in a slow-release fertilizer, you don't have to fertilize or anything. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Judy, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. I think we learned a lot about earth boxes and, uh, and thank you for staying on time and still giving us all this excellent info. So excellent, excellent.
And uh, up next, we have uh, Lorna uh, Bravo um, from the Broward County Extension Office. She's the Extension Director there, Horticulture Extension Agent and Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator. And she's gonna talk to us about hydroponics. So Lorna, go ahead. Thank Welcome. you. Can you, thank you. Can you see my uh, main slide? All good? All right. We can see it perfectly. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys. So I'm used to giving this presentation to, um, we're in Broward County. <clears throat> so like my, uh, Wendy mentioned, I wear many hats here. I'm used to doing this presentation for our urban audience here in South Florida. Um, but my hope today is in my brief time to um, talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges that we have here uh, in Florida overall, but you know, most, most of the challenges you guys have been presenting them during uh, your amazing presentations, in particular South Florida though, um, also identify the opportunities to expand urban agriculture. Um, you know, we, we offer a lot of presentations here on community gardens uh, in today's uh, presentation, school gardens with hydroponics identify and I'll be zooming in and identifying two um, urban food systems uh, under the hydroponics, which is the vertical towers and a hydro kit, which is a new project that we've uh, created from scratch here in Broward County. And then hopefully uh, uh, explain how these systems can be integrated in urban uh, environments such as school. So I like to always start with, you know, I always say globally more than half of the, you know, the population is living in urban areas that rely uh, upon external supplies of resources such as food and clean water. And so we do know that we have an urban, you know, we have a Florida population that keeps growing. Um, so that's putting challenges in our resources. Um, and we also know that, you know, uh, farmers average age is 58. And so we're losing them and it's, it's, we're not creating any more. And we have soil degradation. Uh, within the last 100, 150 years, right? So all of these have challenges, especially as we think about urban um, environments. Uh, here in South Florida, <clears throat> some of the challenges that um, I've uh, been exposed to here within my last three years in Broward County, definitely we have climate change, um, our soil are very sandy soils, uh, and we've been experiencing a lot more um, sea level rise um, challenges, saltwater intrusion, and when we're thinking about growing food in urban um, county, zoning is a challenge that we have. Um, last year, we took it upon ourselves to do um, a survey uh, during the uh, Southeast Master Gardener Regional conference and it was interesting to ask what were some of the barriers to 225 master gardener volunteers uh, uh, when it comes to growing food and as you can see the highest was that they don't have enough space uh, climate conditions and always pests and insect problems and then when we asked them, okay, so we have these challenges, so how are you growing food? Um, it was interesting to uh, summarize it that 42% are saying containers, pots and buckets is their way. Um, 27 are using raised beds. And uh, we still have the hustlers, I say 17% that are still trying to grow in ground soil in our sandy soils, um, in particular here in South Florida. So this was a very interesting um, a observation that we are taking into consideration. Uh, when I came in 2018, I launched, knowing and understanding the challenges that we had, I launched a, um, a multidisciplinary program. It's, uh, it was hydroponic solutions for urban food production. And I uh, gathered um, Hardy County, uh, uh, Hillborough County, Miami-Dade County, Palm Beach, and we put together a sustainable urban food production hydroponics. Uh, and it was very well received. Uh, but we're trying to gauge the interest in South Florida uh, and find opportunities to expand the role of urban agriculture in our areas. It was very well received. We have 4.9 out of 5 in terms of the core satisfaction. We had about 40 participants, but it was very striking to see that a little over half of them were master gardener volunteers. So this preliminary um, data indicated an emerging interest from uh, not just small business owners and enthusiasts, but also our very own and um, ambassadors. Um, and so along with that program, we initiated and collaborated with uh, Fort Lauderdale Research Center, Landscape Ecologist, Dr. John Shaw, and we launched um, the initiative of a sustainable urban food production program. This was added into a module 
for the Master Gardener volunteer. So it, it was one additional module that we added as part of the Master Gardener volunteer. Um, 15 weeks and and this particular module covered um, the basics on hydroponics uh, again we ran this for now we're going to the three years and it was uh, very well received 90, 97 percent level of satisfaction with this program um, it, it's a very intense six weeks uh, and um, it's it's a sustainable urban food programs in Broward County very excited about this initiative um, and it just continues to grow um, also, we join forces uh, with um, our lettuce breeder, Dr. Um, a Herman Sandoya, and uh, as part of the seeded program, we're using the lettuce, uh, UFIFS lettuce lines to uh, use it as a test trial crop for growing hydroponically um, in South Florida, okay? And it is a niche specialty crop. And so for the last three years, we've been joining forces. So now knowing and understanding the challenges in South Florida, understanding that there was an interest um, from our surveys and our pilot testing, um, sustainable urban and hydroponics, um, we have 225 master gardeners in Broward County and uh, we continue to have the program. This uh, training was, uh, included as part of the module. And we started with the concept of training the trainer. Um, initially, um, the effort was to um, a, teach the concept of water use efficiency through uh, the uh, hydroponics efforts. Um, and I always told them that if the Aztecs amazed the Spanish conquistadors with their floating gardens uh, 500 years later, you can do too. Um, and so uh, ever since we run this pilot um, a programming as part of our course, but also I've been gathering data um, to see what are the most um, a connect, what is the connection here of how they can learn through these systems? Uh, in 2019, we did, uh, every year I do a new system for uh, the program and I did a RAF system. Although it was very well received and they learned a lot, as you can see here, um, I think the, the number one issue here was that um, they wanted something, the surveys reflected that they wanted something that they can do hands-on, that they can test it from home, that they can be able to learn how to do proper nutrient uh, solutions. And so we took it upon ourselves and we spent about a year into it and then um, we created a new system which I'll talk to you about in a minute uh, and this was pilot tested during the pandemic um, and it's a hydro kit we call it hydro kit um, it's a very simple system um, but uh, before I get to the system um, I wanted to also uh, let you know that along with uh, that being included into our programs and pilot testing and running a hydroponics uh, trial every year, <clears throat> um, our sustainable urban food program and our master gardener volunteers created a, um, a it's called train the trainer or urban food system demonstration garden at the research center and with that project uh, the master gardeners won the uh, legacy award in 2019 but this would allow us to demo a lot of the systems and then be able to learn from them so the idea is training the trainers um, and as you can see I'm not going to talk about all of them I'm only going to be focusing on the vertical towers and the deep water culture um, as part of that. Um, I always like to, uh, for those that might not be familiar with hydroponics and what it is, um, there's a whole course that I just do about that, but it's really, uh, it's literally working uh, with water in a way of growing almost any crop that uses no soil. And it's more importantly, very little water, right? And um, I always joke and say that, you know, to this day, many people are still unaware of the art and science of hydroponics, even though most of us have practiced it firsthand by placing cut flowers in a vase of water and adding a little plant food. That is starting the basics of hydroponics, you know, which is, uh, you know, it's a very cool concept. Um, I also love to talk about the advantages and most of this we have seen through our pilot uh, projects, you know, plants do grow faster the yield could be bigger. Uh, there is no soil required, which is awesome, especially in South Florida. And uh, because you don't have to be dealing with uh, pest issues. Um, a hydroponics, you can um, grow in less space, very small space, water is saved. And the cool thing that we liked about it is that it, it has a nutrient saving component. And we're thinking about a water quality because we're all connected to bodies of water here in South Florida. This is a really cool principle when we think about growing food in our urban landscape. <clears throat> 
some of the hydroponic systems that uh, Wendy asked me to talk about, I'm going to be concentrating on two. But I do um, like to say that uh, before you think about a system, uh, which we do have presentations on all the systems, uh, you got to think about space availability, lighting, um, there's going to be a finance component, time availability, but I think the most important one is understanding that each of the systems um, ha uh, works better uh, with a specific type of crop. So understanding what it is you want to grow, do your specific research to the plants that you'll be growing is very important. I always say that's the first step to efficiently plan your hydroponic garden. Uh, we always reference to that in South Florida, you know, we are always asked, well, what can you grow in South Florida? We do have this really cool uh, monthly um, a, a crop that you can actually grow and then just knowing what it is you want to grow and understanding the systems uh, would be very um, helpful. When we're thinking about the vertical towers, which probably is one of the systems that many of you guys are very familiarized with it, as part of the sustainable urban demo that we have, we do have several of them. And in Broward County, many of our urban growers have this system, which is great. Um, you know, it's designed to produce crops in vertical rows, irrigated from the top. It can create plant prop uh, a populations, can increase your plant propagation. So you're constrained with space. This is a good system. It, it includes vertical bags or stack pots, as you can see here is ideal for short and long-term crops. So again, it's very specific to what it is. And you mostly you will see leafy greens uh, being uh, the, uh, the, the most preferred uh, crop that you would do on the systems. It has the stackable containers, as you can see here. Um, now containers for nutrient solutions, irrigation system, as you can see. So building that infrastructure is something that um, you would have to consider and um, the growth media. Now I do know in Broward County, we do have a lot of teachers that um, are attempting to use this system, but they have a lot of challenges. Um, one of them is, I mean, it's great for limited spaces. Um, the challenge is the uh, rotating the crops to give an, an even light distribution is one. So knowing whether you're going to be growing this indoor or outdoor is a factor. Like I mentioned to you, the crop selection is another factor that you are uh, in. You know, you would want to do your research on. But I think the biggest problem that we've had is that it does not distribute the nutrients evenly. So you're going to have to have, you're going to tend to have more uh, nutritional deficiencies on the, um, on the crops that you have. Uh, and the hindering factor, the most one is the cost that it comes with it. Um, so as you can imagine, um, here is just a, a cross section for those that are uh, trying to understand how it works. Um, you have, um, you can have the watering as you can see from the top. So you can see the little pockets here of all the crops that, that are you know, throughout the perimeter. But the problem is that again, it does not distribute the nutrients evenly. Um, and the bottom plants receive sometimes the least nutrients due to the upper parts absorbing most of the nutrients. So there is a deficiency that we find. And then the maintenance part of it is the pump is prone to get clogged and accessing the nutrients, you have to lift the whole tower. So there's a physical um, exercise that not a lot of people that, um, that had it like to do. Um, but again, it's just having this, you know, not delivering adequate water and nutrients and like to plant all the levels. And since I'm interested in trying to connect our trainers, our train the trainers with a hydroponic systems, uh, knowing all these challenges, we came up with a, a different solution. We call it the hydro kit, okay? It's very simple. It is a deep water culture. Um, it, it, it's really the concept that you have a container. You remember this is soilless. So you have the water nutrient solution, as you can see, you know, think of this little cross section here. That's what we have inside each of these buckets. Um, and then you have an air stone, air, air compressor and a floating platform, which is really what the plant is going to be uh, resting on. Now, it took us quite some time to be able to come up with this. Um, and so what we did is uh, we tested this system with uh, 13 master gardeners um, to see how they did. Uh, and we did this during a, a, a pandemic, okay? So we did this virtually, uh, which was insane, okay? But the objective of this was we isolated 
13 of them that said they wanted to be part of this pilot. We wanted to teach them through this system the basics on just how to set up a system, okay? Uh, participate with new in the, the, the mixed nutrient solutions because this is probably the most challenging. Uh, and then participants will be able to also test the different uh, UF IFIS letters varieties that we had that were provided by uh, Dr. Shandoya uh, and uh, be able to test which one suited best. Um, and then also be able to understand the water quality measurements that they would need to do, proper fertilizing, and practice nutrient load reduction. So this was the hands-on component that we wanted to do. And this is what it looked like. The, each of them uh, were, uh, adopted a system. Um, a, they all, we also, I'm not talking in this presentation about the uh, seed germination efforts that we had to do because there was another uh, component that we taught them about each of the um, a substrates that they were going to need to be able to grow their lettuces, to be able to transplant them, but that was all part of the course. And then during a the pandemic, the challenge was how to get this project uh, and do it virtually from home. Um, and so we created almost 12 videos, uh, seed germination videos, how to set up everything that they were given. It was like a little kit um, and uh, show them how to start the crops. Um, we created a manual. We have a manual, <coughs> a tutorial. Um, the cool thing about this is we wanted to empower the trainers, the master gardeners, so that they can learn the system and be able to then take it to schools. That's the objective of this, okay? Uh, but you know, when you have a tower that is very expensive versus something that you can do on your own, we came up with a prize, which the kit can be about 50 bucks if you're growing food indoors versus if you're growing it outdoors, which will be 25. And how do we come up with this? We created uh, you know, a spec sheet with all the materials and we tested everything. Uh, it comes, and I'm not gonna go through this because otherwise I run, I burn my time and, and when it's gonna be very mad, but, um, you know, this is pretty much uh, a, everything that was included um, that came to that cost, okay? Thinking how we can be frugal and we can get through the exercise and teach them. Also, uh, as part of our workshop, we joined forces with different professors uh, that would help us um, lead a lot of these sessions. And we, we did a whole one of nutrient solutions. How to take something as simple as miracle Grow uh, and teach the basics on those micronutrients um, because as you know, if you ever attempted to buy um, hydroponic solutions, it's very expensive, okay? So we taught the basics behind on how to do the proper nutrient solution with their kids. Um, also, we've spent a lot of time uh, coming up with systems so that to teach how to grow from PVC their indoor systems. So if they wanted to set this up, we have uh, publications and videos how to do it and how to set everything up uh, indoor. Uh, you know, we are in an urban setting, so we get calls of people wanting to grow food in apartments, in condos, in small spaces. So the idea is that this will help us to be able to cater to um, also not just the schools, but, you know, those, um, those patrons. Um, again, we're working also with um, a, some of the professors to help us with uh, lamp adjustments and growing indoors. So we have a, this works, this works great. Uh, we tested that. Again, the kit comes with a timer and a small LED light. Okay, and that is if you're interested in growing food inside. So class of 2020, all virtual, took it upon themselves, half of them, um, and this is what they did. They grew everything. Uh, we're so proud. Every time I see the lettuces, it's like, yes, it worked. Uh, they learned a lot, uh, but here was the thing. They engaged. They were able to do the nutrient solutions. They were able to grow the lettuces successfully with the kids. The question is, are they going to continue? Okay, are we really going to continue? So we tested different things because everybody's like, well, Lauren is always testing those lattices. Can we do other things? <laughs> so yes, you can. The idea is we go through the course, you learn the basics and then you can test whatever you want. Uh, and these are some of the different varieties. We had basils, we even have a crimson watermelon that we, uh, we, we ran in the greenhouse. Uh, but it was cool that in our surveys, 80% uh, of them said they are going to continue. So they took everything they learned and they're going to continue. And guess what? They did. They sent me pictures uh, and they told me, look, Lorna, I grew on a, uh, you know, I, I, I put everything together based on what I learned and now I'm doing Swiss chard from home. Uh, or look, I'm doing Genovese basils. 
um, and they're continuing to not just uh, take the basics, but then they're teaching me the things that they change and was pretty cool. Uh, and then others are just the like the idea of repurposing and recycling. So they're taking different containers and running them into um, the same concepts. And as you can see, they're growing zucchini and all kinds of stuff. So that was a really cool experience. Again, I think Carlita mentioned that in Broward, we're very involved with FNP. I love everything and all the resources that they have. And I think that, you know, working together is fantastic. Um, you know, uh, connecting children to the source of their food. It is a hustle here in South Florida and I'm sure many of other counties. Um, so we see that these kinds of projects will help us to make it eventually to schools with our ambassadors, right? We have over 270 students, uh, 200 and 70,000 students in one of the US largest schools, which is Broward County. And you know, we talk about those farmers at the beginning. I always tell the master gardeners, you know, the teachers are the foundations to lay in, uh, in the minds of our students about the sustainable food productions. They're the next generation, they're the future leaders, right? So uh, bringing these kinds of exercises and projects to school, I think is very exciting. And by far, this little kid has uh, made it the farthest. Um, uh, this is some of our master gardeners in action as part of the crunch that Carlita was talking about. Uh, and here's just telling, uh, we bring in the how to grow uh, component, you know, uh, which has been really awesome. And uh, together with the Hydro K, my hope is that by next year, we'll be able to have more information that we can share um, all of these um, efforts with schools uh, and introduce urban gardening to Broward schools, right? Um, I know that some of you guys were talking about uh, self-watering containers. We also have a self-watering container bucket here uh, and we have a drawing of how it works. Uh, we, we just pilot tested this uh, system. Uh, we actually have a kit and uh, we wanna empower people to know how to do it themselves, right? So that's what um, I'm very interested in doing with a lot of our programs. And so we did, we uh, sent these self-watering kits to uh, Sherwin Elementary. These were second graders, second graders, okay? And we took two master gardeners and they pilot tested the self-watering to 75 elementary students during COVID, okay? And they grew Okinawa spinach. So that was pretty cool, right? So if we can do it this way, my hope is that hopefully next year we can bring the hydro kits and then teach them how to grow hydroponically, you know, in small spaces. Uh, you can check us out. We have a video. We are the South, South Florida Hydroponic Initiative team uh, under Cafe Latino. Uh, and we're always looking for innovative ways to engage people uh, and show them how to. And I think, um, you know, the synergy between the Master Gardeners and the FMP and schools is one that I'm really interested in. So thank you. And um, oh my gosh. How did you do it? You did it. It was amazing. Lorna. There go 60 slides. <laughs> we have to, we have to get our hands on the how to's. So please um, drop either drop that in the chat box or send it to me. Um, and we will get that out to our participants today because that kit looks amazing. I'm excited about that. Thank you. Thank guys. you. Thank you so much. Awesome job. Awesome job. So um, our next speaker is Sarah Hensley, and she's going to help us kind of start thinking about how we can start to evaluate our work in our school gardens. And uh, Sarah is uh, going to start presenting to us um, at, at two. She does have to be off at three. Uh, Sarah is our 4-H representative uh, in this in-service training. She is somewhat of an evaluation expert as it goes with 4-H youth development. And Sarah, we're so thrilled that you can join us today. So thank you, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Wendy. Um, an expert, oh goodness, you have set me up here today, <laughs> but thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak with all of you today. Uh, it appears I'm sharing my screen from my side. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I see lots of 4-H faces on here and others that I know. So you guys know I'm pretty uh, non-formal when it comes to presenting and talking about evaluation. It is a super important topic. As Wendy said, my name is Sarah Hensley and um, my position is a state specialized extension agent with the 4-H Youth Development Program. And I am happy to share these slides with you all a little bit later on. But as we think about evaluation, 
I know you guys have been full of content today and really heard some good information regarding school gardening and how to's and how to make things happen. So what I want to talk to you a little bit today is about how to tell your story, right? Um, telling your story when it comes to 4-H programs, extension programs, any sort of informative intervention that we do is all about, yes, collecting data, um, but also to really think about that story and tell the best story. Whether it's for your stakeholders, for your ROA reporting, for you to be able to improve your next program. I attended an evaluation training with Dr. Harder one time and she said, you know, we always collect data thinking about reporting, but what about the importance of collecting data for program development, program improvement? So that's also a really important component of evaluation. Uh, today, I'm going to start out at the beginning because, again, in order to really tell a complete story, you have to start with that situation statement. And then you determine what you're going to measure based on your needs, the needs of your clients, right, and your program objectives. And, of course, collecting the data. All of these steps combined really work together to help you present a story that represents your entire educational program. So what I would love for you guys to do real quick is take a minute just to pause and think about the story that you want to tell about your school gardening program. Is it a whole book? Is it a chapter in the book? Or maybe is it just a paragraph in a larger chapter of the story that you're telling about your educational program efforts? So take a minute just to think about that. And if anybody wants to put thoughts in the chat box, that would be great. Okay, so I don't see any thoughts in the chat box, but if you want to unmute, I'm cool with that also. Okay, so again, as we're thinking about the story we want to tell, we have to start with the issue. This may, um, of course, be redundant for many of you because we always talk about situation statements, right? The needs needs assessment, if you are part of symposium or attended any of the needs assessment ISTs that uh, the PDEC team that we offer throughout the spring, then you heard about the importance of collecting needs assessment data from your clients. But it's always important when we talk about evaluation to restate that importance of beginning program development with the needs in mind. Your situation statement is the introduction chapter of your story. This is the first sentence in your paragraph, right? You're beginning to tell us why it's important that you've collected this data. So when we talk about school gardening, there's a need that exists to educate young people about the practices that support healthy living, science competencies, best management practices related to gardening, conservation of water, sustainable agricultural practices, all of those things. And then when we think about change, if we provide a good educational intervention that focuses on that need, then we know change will occur, right? Young people will attain that knowledge, that skill. They will adopt that behavior in the subject matter area that you're focusing on. So we always have to, again, think about um, that big need that we have before we start collecting data. So what are we measuring? Um, the top model is an extension-based model that we talk about when we look at both program development and then on the flip side, the performance of our programs, how those programs turn out, the results of our programs. So we have to start, see the red circle right here around knowledge, attitude, skills, and aspiration, aspirations. Those are our short-term outcomes. Those are the things that are going to happen pretty quickly when we're educating either adults and or young people. And then we're going to move into the practices. So when you talk about program development and evaluation, sometimes we want to jump right into behavior change, right? But again, thinking back to the story that you're telling and how your school gardening program fits into your longer term overall big picture program, you really need to start and think, 
are these youth going to have time to adopt a behavior? Or is it better for us to look at telling a story about aspirations to encourage healthy eating practices at home or sustain buying health, fresh fruits and vegetables in the supermarket, right? So we have to start at the beginning and then move into practices or behaviors adopted, which are medium-term outcomes. And then finally, at the top, you'll see social, economic, environmental, those sorts of SEEC type of impacts that are more long-term. So again, I'm gonna, have a, I'm gonna ask for a little bit of interaction here. And um, some of you all, I don't know, but I really want you to just take a minute. Don't hit enter and put it in the chat until I say to. But what I'm gonna ask all of you to do is take a minute and consider what your school gardening program looks like or what you want it to look like. Some of you may not have started your programs yet. And think about, is it a short-term program where you drop off seeds with a teacher? Or do you go in and educate students once a week? Do you utilize a hands-on learning and really focus your efforts on reflection and life skill development? Are you teaching youth that they should eat fruits and vegetables at home? So think about what your overall program looks like, your program goals, your needs, Think about that and then type into the chat what type of program you are or are planning on offering. And hit enter. I'm going to give you a few minutes. Everybody has time to type and we're going to hit enter all at once. Okay, I'm going to give you about one 60 seconds to finish typing out what you want to say, and then I'll let you guys hit enter so it floods the chat box with great ideas. Okay, everyone can hit enter and let's see what you think. Daniel, that's great. Okay. Skill building, responsibility, goals, Kim, good. Weekly interaction, that's good. Okay, Ticey, you're saying you utilize the ag teachers in your school to deliver the program, but you're training those ag teachers. Um, Jose, knowledge, team building, nutrition, good. Okay. Seasonal, says Jamie. Okay, so as you guys can see, we have a wide range of the type of programming that we're offering across the state here. We have Master Gardener volunteer. Okay, Shri, you just put in here your uh, Master Gardener volunteers for the actual teaching component. So we have lots of different ways that we are providing our program. Okay, so I know I put up a slide here of a logic model and some of you are like, oh, seriously, don't talk about logic models. Please don't talk about logic models. But we have to look at and think about, again, what our output, what our educational program looks like and if you'll see my number one bullet point here, consider, is this a big P program or a little P program? Again, when I gave the analogy of the story to begin with, is it a chapter in your book? Is it the whole story or is it just a paragraph in the chapter? But Wendy loves, okay, good, Wendy. I'm glad that you love logic models. I do, I do too, but I know I'm a nerd like that. So, um, And I just want you to know that some of us like to lump a little bit more than others. But it really is important still to think about, is this a big P or a little P program? And again, um, thinking about your extension program, most likely you have an overall, if you're not a necessarily a 4-H agent, you're uh, a horticulture agent or another type of ag agent, sustainable food systems is your primary program maybe. Um, maybe youth are just one aspect of your clientele. So you're really wanting to measure the same goals for your youth audience as you are for your adult audience. And just because the delivery looks a little different, maybe your outcomes or your goals are the same. 
So thinking about that when we evaluate, and especially when we kind of think about how we're going to tell that story, it's important to remember we're not measuring the outputs. We're not measuring the number of youth that attended my school garden program, right? Because that's just looking at the number of youth that participated or attended. That's not going to tell our story. Again, maybe that school garden program is just one activity that leads to your overall big P program objectives. So you want to make sure you're measuring um, your youth audience in an age appropriate way, but you're measuring the same principles for all of your, young, your audiences. And if your delivery changes, that's okay too. We obviously, um, the last speaker just took up, talked about the pandemic and we did a lot of virtual program delivery. So remember your programmatic goals have remained the same based on the needs of your client, but your delivery is the only thing that has changed. And the same is true of school gardening, after school workshops, perhaps you're measuring the same types of outcomes in your school gardening program as you are in a summer day camp program. The second thing, um, and I think I kind of hit on this a second ago, but we can't say it enough, especially because I know that this is um, something that our DEDs remark on quite frequently is that we want to make sure we're not measuring outputs. We're not talking about the number of schools where we planted a garden. Stick to those outcomes. I'm just going to check and make sure I don't have any questions here in the chat. It looks like we're okay. So let's move into, we've kind of given the basics now, right? We've talked about the importance of starting with the end in mind, where you're going, we've talked about identifying your needs, and then we talked about what kind of program you're delivering. Is it a big program or is it a component of a larger program? When we talk 4-H, we have two primary programs. So if you are not in 4-H, or if you are, it doesn't matter, see this red area, evaluate this. When you're talking about your school gardening programs, you're looking at the subject matter skills and the life skills. So for some of our 4-H folks, we move down and talk a little bit because we all know there's some overlap here. We talk about the context that we're delivering in as well, because we have to be very intentional in our programming to make sure that we are educating in a space for youth where they feel like they belong, they have an opportunity to gain independence, make decisions, mastery of skills, all of those things. So we also get to think about how we train our volunteers. And for our horticulture agents that have Master Gardener volunteer programs, you also get to think about how you're educating volunteers. In the chat earlier, we saw that some of you are using Master Gardener volunteers or ag teachers. So can you measure the skill attainment or the context that those folks are providing in a direct teaching? Um, situation. You also want to think about partnering with your 4-H agent to make sure that the volunteers are aware of how to best work with young people, how to really provide that meaningful learning experience, and then you can perhaps move into some of those more medium-term type outcomes and measure adoption of behavior for volunteers. Again, all of this goes back to thinking about the educational intervention that you are providing for your volunteers. But moving back to priority work group number one, and this is going to, I'm going to show you just a second, if you're not a 4-H agent, how you can report on this and workload as well. You really want to think about objectives that are going to fall into life skills like decision making, responsibility, teamwork, wise use of resources, or subject matter. Subject matter is really kind of the this content, or as we like to say in 4-H, the spark or the project. This is what kids are excited about learning about. You can talk about best management practices of gardening, water conservation, sustainable food systems, healthy living, healthy eating, physical activity, all of those sorts of things right here under subject matter skills. I'm gonna share a couple of sample objectives with you here. Um, some of the top ones here, Wendy provided, these are ones that she used with her third and fourth grade students in our science space. And some of the ones on the bottom are examples that you may also consider if you want to measure more of the life skill side of things or perhaps healthy, li healthy living. Um, and I know that as educators, we remember we have sometimes have to say things more than one time. 
but make your objectives really reflect the type of story that you're going to tell. So that way, when we move to data collection in a few slides, you're actually collecting something that represents these objectives and you're reporting on the objectives. So as you can see, the top uh, couple of objectives here are talking about that knowledge, understanding of the plants that are grown throughout the growing season, the plant parts and their function, photosynthesis, right? Insect metamorphosis, and we kind of move into some of the, we could talk about beneficial pests, right? Um, and then when we're talking about those life skills, perhaps you want to really look at what is the, um, what is the volunteer, what is the teacher, what is the um, other provider of direct instruction noticing? Are they noticing that young people are actually being more responsible? Are they cooperating with their peers better? Those are things that you can observe, that you can measure, you can report on. And then healthy living. Healthy living is a huge part of school gardening programs. Are the youth trying vegetables or trying new fruits? Are they telling us that they're eating these things at home more? Are they being more physically active? Is maybe their stress reduced by being out in a, um, in a gardening activity, being outside, doing some things like that? Um, are they encouraging their parents and guardians to, actu guardians to actually purchase fresh fruits and vegetables at home? These are some of the sample objectives. And again, I'll share this with you guys if you're interested in using these example objectives for your reporting. But these are some of the things that we really want to think about as we start to develop the measurement tools that we're going to use. I told you that we have some workload indicators that you can report on because of course these things all align with one another and we want to make it easier, not harder for our county extension agents. And across 4-H, we've created lots of sample objectives in our plans of action that match workload. So um, if you have ever checked when you start to enter workload data, yes, I work with you, then you saw these two indicators pop up, right? So any of those previous examples, except for that life, um, life skill one, you can pop into these workload indicators, just a simple copy and paste. It doesn't matter the subject matter area, but if youth are demonstrating a knowledge gain in a subject matter or a behavior change, then you can report those here under these workload indicators. And that really, um, that really helps us as we're looking across the board for federal reporting of how many folks are actually programming for young people and youth audiences and how many youth are there for attaining some of those short-term knowledge gain type outcomes or even medium-term behavior change. I'm just going to check the chat, make sure we don't have any questions here. So how can we collect some data um, on the objectives that we've shared today? Don't be afraid. I put observation at the top, not surveys, because I love the data that you can get from qualitative um, data collection. And you can have an observation of youth by you as the extension agent. You can have master gardener volunteers observe young people in gardening environments. You can have teachers. You really don't want to, um, to discredit the power of, of observation. Of course, we can survey, um, but think beyond just surveying young people. Because a lot of times, if you're offering a school garden program, you may not have the same. I know we used to provide gardening programs at an after school site, and we would have one group of kids one week and a different group the next week, and sometimes a third kid wouldn't be there. So it's really hard to do those pre post type assessments. But you can do overall. And remember, um, I know a few of the folks that are on here today participated in a PYD Academy a couple of weeks ago. And a renowned youth development professor, he reminded us that uh, surveys are averages and averages don't always capture what's happening. So let's think about looking at asking our teachers overall, what are young people gaining? What are the parents telling us that their kids are coming home and doing? Are they actually being more willing to try different fresh foods, fruits and vegetables? Are they encouraging them to buy things at the supermarket that they wouldn't reg regularly buy? 
Um, I have some funny stories about my niece, actually, like I'll, I'll have kiwi or different things all the time. And my daughter loves things like that. And my niece is kind of like, eh, I don't know about that, but then she'll try it. And then she goes home and says, we need to buy kiwis. And her mom's like, how did you get her to eat this? But um, it's always just about trying. And then our parents, they give us such a broader perspective of what their youth are actually doing at home um, beyond what a survey in a classroom can do. And then qualitative testimonies. This is one of the most powerful data collection techniques, I believe, for young people, because it really allows young people just to tell us some things that their, their perception of a program. And then we are able as the professional to kind of plug those into the buckets where they kind of fit. So some examples of data to tell your story that may result as um, of a result of using a couple of those techniques earlier. Sorry about the double use of result there. But um, score sheets, you can track over time. If young people are completing worksheets as part of your program, if you have a checklist, you can check, go through and check off the things that young people are doing. Keep track of those scores. Sometimes we, we kind of tend to want to live year to year, right? But if we're collecting the same data over multiple years, it's pretty simple to just create a table, and, and I'm talking about ROAs now, but create a table, a cumulative table over time of the types of scores that young people are um, attaining on whether worksheets, maybe their record books or project books. I put in here journals. Journals at the end of day camps, summer programming, um, after school sites, Journals are a great way for kids to pause at the end of a learning experience and really just reflect, you know, reflect on what they've learned. You can, of course, give them prompts. I love prompts. You want to give them something like, what is a new vegetable that you learned about today? What is a new practice that we tried? Did you identify any new insects in the garden today? Um, journals just, and of course, this can include, if you have younger kids, let them draw pictures. That's great because that still gives you an idea of what they're learning and what they think that they're getting out of the program. And then it's just a simple matter of keeping track of that and noting that 20% of the youth in their, report, in their journal self-reported that they identified a new insect or that they tried a new fruit or vegetable. And all of those things are powerful over time, and it shows that young people are actually benefiting from your program. And again, back to my original point, it helps you tell that story. Keep a spreadsheet of um, the youth that are reporting that they are doing things like eating fruits and veggies at home, because they're going to come back to your programs and they're going to say, hey, I got my mom to go go buy kiwis at the grocery store and we're eating them now at home and do sort of those sorts of things. Um, if you're observing student behaviors, I really encourage you to start out your observation at the beginning with a rubric, back to those needs, back to those uh, objectives that you've written. Think about what are the things you're going to in be intentional. This is my favorite word in the world, I think, is intentional. But really think about what you're going to be intentional about watching for. Are there youth or who are taking a desired action? Are they showing that you've learned a concept as the course progresses? Again, do not be afraid of this qualitative data, but do it in an intentional manner so that you can kind of see, are kids starting to take more responsibility for the care of the garden without being directed to do so? Uh, we talked earlier about parents. Um, make sure that you, you talk to your parents you can, this can be as simple as like a three question open ended survey that you send home to the parents of youth who are participating and say, what is something new that your kid told you about that they learned during our school gardening program? What is something new that your child encouraged your family to do? Um, so giving parents an opportunity to provide feedback and of course, teachers. Uh, we have a couple of other school enrichment programs across Florida 4-H, like one of the most popular, of course, is public speaking, formerly known as Tropicana. And the teacher surveys, they just really give us a much better handle on the change that students from the beginning to the end of the school year than what the young people report on and their surveys. 
Um, I would love to see if anyone else has any other ideas that they would like to put in the chat um, before I move on. Um, in conclusion, I know that's a quick 30 minutes um, uh, evaluation discussion there, but if you remember nothing else from today, I really, really encourage you just to plan ahead. Um, if you plan ahead, then you're more effectively able to tell your story about whether it's school gardening, whether it's an after school program or a summer day camp series. Any of those evaluations that you're planning for, it all starts with that need and that situation at the beginning. Um, and as we move into survey design, uh, we, you know, Glenn Israel, Dr. Israel and PDEC has some really great resources as far as survey design um, and some of those sorts of things. Um, I can certainly help you with any of the observation rubrics or things like that. John Diaz is also super good at qualitative data collection. Um, Tropicana is no longer, Linda, but however, we do still have 4-H school enrichment program. It's just not sponsored by the Tropicana um, company, but we, act, we do still have 4-H school enrichment programs that focus on public speaking. So if anyone has any questions, um, I would love to see those, or you can send them to me via email. I'll put my email in the chat. And Kim, that's great. A journal page, that's good. What, uh, what do you think about, um, you know, talking to that educational supervisor and, um, you know, ask, asking her those, him or her those questions about, about their learning or, or maybe partnering with them for the evaluation? I think, I think that's great. I, with the um, public speaking school enrichment program, we send surveys directly to teachers. We have a survey that actually triangulates with the same questions we're asking kids and parents. So you can do something very similar for any of your in-school, after-school gardening type programs. Again, um, you really want to kind of have the same measures because whether it's the teacher giving you the answers to those um, questions or the youth, you want to be able to be collecting the same type of data. So I think it's great. We can do those sorts of things through call tricks. Um, teachers are pretty good actually about, if it's not super long, completing a survey about what their kids have learned as a result of a, participating in a program. Yeah, it's, a good this, this is a great presentation. I, I, I remember the first, my first day camp a million years ago, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just one-on-one -on -one ask, ask the camper, see how they did. And oh gosh, they thought they were in trouble because they had to talk to Miss Wendy. I was like, this is a disaster. Uh, There's gotta be another way, you know? So I don't. Yeah, uh, journals are great for that. Like, and um, anytime, even when I was in the county, I would collect, I would have journals for the youth, regardless of who the agent was teaching the subject matter area. It didn't matter if it was a livestock agent, a board agent. Um, you know, Jim always, has done great bug camps in the county I was in previously. And the kids would reflect on their experience at the end of every day in journal. And they drew pictures, they talked about what they learned and it was just, was awesome. It was great feedback. Great, 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 great. Sarah, we really appreciate you Absolutely. In and, and kind of getting us to think about those intentions. You know, what are we intending to do? You said that was your favorite word as you're thinking about evaluation. And I'm going to really take that away with me from your training. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate you being here. All right. So um, up next is myself and Ms. Jeannie Necessary. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and because Kim Bent sent me a really cute picture while we were working on um, her uh, egghead people, which I think are really cute. So Kim, do you wanna say anything about these? Here I am. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I, um, I do a lot with PRD after school. So I try to incorporate different lessons like we talked about journaling. So I use that for like intern, um, intrapersonal skills and um, it's a safe way for kids. But this was 
I had been working on embryology programming simultaneously doing the Gordons, talk about nutrition. Mm -hmm. So this was a little fun thing, you know, calcium in the garden, eggs, embryology. And um, the first day I drew the faces per order, you know, I had an astronaut, a pirate, and I was over two hours at the after school. So um, my advice is to uh, draw faces in advance and kind of cap into your um, youth personality. But so this was an integration of a couple different uh, educational components we were working on. Good. Well, and thank it was you. Fun. It was so fun. <laughs> they must have loved it. They, they did. Just, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to, uh, Jeannie and I are going to talk a little bit about resources now. Um, so the some of the resources that are out there are really excellent. And um, so the first one and one of the ones that we've been leaning really heavy on today is the Junior Master Gardener curriculum from Texas A&M. This is not inexpensive. Um, the leader's book is over $50 um, and the gardening handbook is also expensive as well. Um, this would be worth raising funds for or finding grant funding for or finding a way to fund it, especially for the teacher's leader's guide, because um, all the activities that we did today and some of the things, a lot of the things we've talked about are there. Um, I'm going to show you the chapters. The gardening handbook is it's around, uh, it's between 20 and $30, I believe, and their idea is to have uh, every student have it. Uh, it's like their book. And so if you can afford it, it's great. And um, if, you, if you cannot, I would definitely try to invest in the teacher leader guide, at least so you can have that on in your reference library. Um, I'm gonna see if I can't take us, see if you can to the website here. Let me see, you can't see it, can you? Okay, hang on. Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. You can see the website? Okay. Um, so this is, you go to uh, JMG and um, you call order online or call and they're super fast. It comes within just a couple of days. And um, let me see if I can show you. So they have some of the chapters by resources. So the first chapter is uh, plant growth and development. And these are some of the topics that they go through. Uh, another chapter is soil and water. And so there's a lot of uh, lessons on that. And all of the chapters include a leadership and service learning project. So you can go back and um, um, have the kids do a service project. So those are involved as well. And then we have an environment, uh, ecology and environmental horticulture chapter. And these are some of the um, topics of the lessons there. And the entomology chapter, insect basics, life cycles, collecting, insect plant interaction, insect management, plant disease. So each of these has a lesson as well as an activity. And one of the things that, I'm gonna go ahead and click out of this now. Um, one of the things that you'll see is that you can flip to the back and you can see where educational standards are met. So if the teacher is saying, oh, I don't know if I wanna spend that time, you know, we have to meet our Sunshine State standards, you could find the standards in the, um, in the back of the book and tie them to the Sunshine State standards and show them that it, the kids will actually be learning from the um, time spent in the garden and on the lessons that are there. So one of the things that's interesting about the Junior Master Gardener program is that they encourage you to register a club in Texas uh, with, the, with Texas A&M. And so if you wanna to go to that level, you certainly can. Um, there are certainly clubs that do that here in, um, in Florida. So Jeannie, would you like to say something about the Junior Master Gardener? So I did wanna, um just mentioned that in terms of the curriculum that the family nutrition program uses um, at this time, this particular curriculum is not 
one of the ones that we have been using. However, we do use the other one that will be reviewed uh, in, more broadly, the Learn, Go, Eat, and Grow um, curriculum as one of our uh, curriculums we can use with the gardens. But yeah, I actually thought one of the best and coolest components was that um, connection uh, and actually registering, especially if you have like an after school group that you're working with to register and register them because it goes on a map on their website and you can see where other clubs exist um, around the country. And I thought that was one of the coolest things about the actual um, curriculum piece was just see so kids could see that there were more uh more more students around the country using this curriculum right be, the be part learning project be part too. of the bigger bigger program yeah, yeah. exactly as Sarah said program with a big p really big p for that one <laughs> um the other thing I wanted to mention is that many of the activities that are in uh learn grow eat go are also in this curriculum so not to not to worry about um, not that they're not exclusive. So they have they duplicated them in Learn, Grow, Eat, Go. OK, so the next one I would like to talk about. Oh, um, Julio, what is the ages appropriate for both programs? That's a really good question. Um, you know, and, and what what are the appropriate ages for for school gardening? I mean, I think, you know, anything from kindergartners all the way up if they're five they're good right so <laughs> anything up from uh five to 18 and your program is going to be delivered in different ways at different levels um julio so you know my favorite age is third and fourth graders because they are nimble they're smart they're um curious still but they haven't gotten cool yet so i really like i like that uh, a little bit younger you have to be little bit more hands-on with them uh, and this is in my humble opinion so the um so for me the junior master gardener um resource here is probably right up to about uh middle school okay um but you and i did the activities today uh earlier and we had fun so i could even see this going into into middle school with not a problem or using at least the activities and the lessons and then um elaborating on them for our older kids um and then the learn grow eat go is Jeannie correct me if I'm wrong I think targeted at first and second graders I'm gonna I'm gonna look that up real quick while we uh okay. talk because I think it might be a little bit older a little bit older I think Lisa Lisa it was it's when I remember it being just a tad younger than the age that I normally worked with, so um, so probably less than uh, less than third grade, but we'll find out for sure. Uh, but the the activities here are proven; uh, they are exciting. They're the kids learn a lot from these, and then there is a lot for you to be able to, to elaborate on. And one of the things that with all of the, all of the resources we're about to look at, you'll see that um, they say um, they. They give you a recipe. They let you all the, let you know all the materials needed, and they let you know how long it's going to take. And if it's the plant person who's going to sprout head, they they're going to tell you it's going to take a week for that grass to sprout. So they give they don't let you go into it too blind. Um, another point, and I'm I'm sorry to turn my back real quick, but there are um, older curriculum for the um, and, um, ancillary curriculum or additional curriculum that goes with Junior Master Gardener. One is literature in the garden. So if you're really stressing reading to the, um, to the children, to the students, this is great. Um, they have fantastic books that go along with it. One is one of my favorites is um, Gardens uh, Bottoms and Tops about, um, about a bear. And then there's a and another one called wildlife in the garden. So if you are doing pollinators or birds or um, other uh, outside activities, this is a good one for creating habitat and learning about the environment a little bit more, a little bit more ecology leaning. So there's a host of, of different um, uh, collab coordinating curriculum that goes with Junior Master Gardener. So check out their website and see. Um, 
I think you'll be really impressed with the amount of materials that they have. They have a um, one for middle school that's kind of based like a um, detective story. And so the kids through their lessons um, solve mysteries. And so if you're working with an older group that seems to appeal to them. All right, I'm gonna jump into our next resource, which is Gardening for Grades. And this is through um, the Department of um, Florida Ag in the Classroom. And this is usually free for those who request it. There's great activities in there. They also have lear learning objectives and educational standards. So again, I have to turn my back. I'll be right back. So go ahead. And they also have gardening for nutrition, which is a neat one. And the Gardening for Grades book. And um, it's a comprehensive guide for Florida's teachers. I, I sometimes pull, act, have sometimes pulled activities out of both of these. Um, to, find out which is, I just saw what she keeps on. Okay. And um, hang on. So these are, these are great. Great for the teacher grant by FAITC. So Beth um, brings up the point that they do um, have um, Florida Ag in the Classroom grants. And so if you wanted to buy these books through those grants to help um, fund your garden and um, back up your garden, these are terrific. So the um, Gardening for Grades is a terrific book too. And can I share yeah. something? Sure. Um, I've helped a couple of different teachers write the grant for Florida Ag in the Classroom. It's a teacher grant that they received the money and it's for small things. Um, those two teachers did, but it really, really helped get them involved in the grant writing process, obtaining the information and then get excited about doing a small garden project or one, one teacher did an embryology project. Um, and then they send the supplies along with the book straight to the teacher. It was really a great end for me. So Beth was saying that it's a it's a it's a end to get funding, but it's also a way to really get the teachers involved in the outcomes of what's going to happen with that grant money. And it looks good for them. You know, they write a grant, they get it, and then they're able to have this awesome program and great partnership that goes along with that. OK, and then the next one to talk about is. Um, Grow to Learn, which is a University of Florida IFAS publication, um, and they have good chapters. Um, and I'm going to actually click on this one because this one uh, ties back to our Sunshine State standards too. So this is good. Okay, it's probably going to open. Okay, great. So let's take a look at this. And they have, um, you know, questions about starting or answers about starting seeds, you know, why garden with students, how do I create a successful garden, how do I get started, and then they have uh, testimonials and case studies here, um, and they have um, best practices for soil in Florida, site selection, and what curriculum uh, curricula are out there. So they even have a review of the curriculum um, that I think that is it's good for you to be able to see. So it is, um, they even have estimated cost. This is very, very Florida focused. It's from IFAS. Um, could it be updated? Probably, but for the most part, it's really, really good information. And they even talk, this one I like because they even talk about fundraising, how to do fundraising, and basically the general cost of what a raised bed would boil down to be. So this is a great, um, this is a great resource for us too. And if you notice that I clicked on it and it's actually still living at the Sarasota um, Extension Office. It's not being supported on EDIS anymore. So if you have to go look for it, I would go grab the uh, Grow to Learn resource. So, Jean. Can I, yeah, can I, we, so um, I've been using actually this guy to help also train like uh, new staff because it's very comprehensive um from start to finish 
And one of the things um, I know Carlita had mentioned during her presentation was that we actually um, partnered with Florida Ag in the Classroom um, over the past year to provide a school garden leadership training to teachers all across uh, the state of Florida. Um, it was actually one of those like beneficial opportunities that occurred um, through COVID. Um, and when, if we, or when we start doing the school garden leadership training in person, um, the teachers would receive a copy of this book um, as we've been able to um, print some copies of it. Uh, but with it being online, I think it's very beneficial because you can search for different topics. But sorry, to step back, just to say that the school garden leadership training really focuses on um, the teachers uh, becoming leaders uh, we say leaders, not leaders, um, and their schools. And, and this guide it goes along with it in that uh, it teaches them like how to create a uh, garden committee at their school. Because to go back to some th a comment someone said earlier about uh, teachers, if they don't have the support of their administration or other folks at the school, it's almost like a full-time job just taking care of a garden. So I really like this guide a lot. As Wendy mentioned, it could probably be updated because it's been a couple, uh, it's been a couple years since it's been published. But I do think it's a really great and comprehensive guide on how to get started and specific um, objectives that or questions that a teacher might have. And you bring up a really good point because there are teachers who really want to garden but have no clue. And I know that everybody on here has encountered these people and they have big hearts and they want to do what's best for their students. Um, and they just, they're, they're really starting from even behind square one. And this, um, this book is very empowering, I think, to teachers. So I'm glad, Jeannie, that you're using this when you're training teachers because it, it really, if they're lost, this book can help them figure out what's going on and what happens next. Um, and I think that that's a real powerful resource for them. So with that, I would like to ask you all, what, what are you using for resources and what, what are your some of your favorite resources that you would feel like you would want to share, um, share about? And I can also share some of the free resources that uh, we utilize with the USDA um, and give it, give you all some time to kind of uh, talk amongst yourselves here. Sure. Do you want me to stop share, Jeannie? Yeah, sure. I've got it. I've got the websites up so y'all can see. Okay, it. great. So Kim says uh, she has used all along uh, with ag in the classroom. And mm -hmm. Julio says his resources is 4-H agent. <laughs> I like that. Um, Pat Bonas always uses the UF and uh, vegetable gardening guide. Taylor's used Florida Ag in the Classroom and Junior Master Gardener. Great. Yeah, so I'm going to share with you all. Um, so I, I put in the chat the Florida Ag in the Classroom um, uh, website. And then I put the second one in, which is the garden resources. So if you go here, you can see you've got gardening for grades um, and gardening for nutrition. Um, gardening for nutrition is one of the um, copies that, or excuse me, one of the copies, one of the curriculums that we use. Um, it's for younger students. You can see gardening in, or kindergarten to second grade. Um, and you can request a hard copy. Um, they are free. So you can see, this is, like I said, this is one of the ones that the Family Nutrition Program utilizes. Um, and then I wanted to show you, one of the cool things is that there is, uh, actually, let me go here. So the USDA has team nutrition and there are tons of free resources here. So uh, you can order them online. Uh, you could say whether you're a school, state agency or a partner, um, and just a, just a shout out to my plate it is actually my plate's birthday this month. I think it's uh, 10 years of my plate. So uh, they have all kinds of resources for my plate, uh, CA, CFP, anything you really want that's connected with the USDA, uh, you can find it here. And then just to highlight some of the garden resources, so team nutrition garden resources, again, these are free materials. 
um, they're printed materials and you can get them in bulk and or on a one-off basis. But one of the, um, the curriculums that the Family Nutrition Program uses, again, this is for a younger audience, but is grow it, try it, like it. Um, and they had, they have actually re, um, uh, they like, what am I trying to say? Re, uh, created the grow it, try it, like it. Um, they repackaged it. That was the word I was looking for, uh, before it came in this box and all this stuff. Now it's in a nice, like just one, um, binder or excuse me, one booklet that you get. Um, and we used to use, but I think we're retiring the use of the Great Garden Detective, but no reason that you guys can't, so use it. So there's the Great Garden Detective, um, dig in to talk about standards nutrition education from the ground up. So you can see, and then you've got posters, all kinds of posters. They also put webinars on here if you want to learn more. And there are specific lessons for Grow It, Try It, Like It that focus on sweet potatoes, cantaloupe, strawberry patch. So you can see there's a lot of free resources here on team nutrition. And then finally, I just wanted to show you that SnapEd, the SnapEd gardening that tomato looks very similar to mine. Um, that this is the gardening page for SnapEd. Um, so again, teaching gardening with SnapEd, uh, different toolkits and uh, different states that have, and you can see actually on here, um let's see so on here at the bottom is the grow to learn guide that's one of the resources on the SnapEd uh, garden site and nutrition to grow on so there's some other resources to kind of look at through the SnapEd library as well so that's what I wanted to show y'all I had no idea there was so much there yeah, and the great thing is, like I said, I actually, um, I had an opportunity for a couple of years to work with the uh, Florida Department of Agriculture. I was working on the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. So that's where I became really familiar with team nutrition. And like I said, team nutrition has just got a ton of free resources that you can get um, to distribute to your uh, schools, to your, um, your sites that you work with. And again, Florida Ag in the Classroom is the same way. They have free resources as well. And I know um, that we're, they're also working on some posters too that they will be looking to distribute um, over the next school year. So um, there's just a lot of great resources out there um, for you all to utilize that don't necessarily cost money as well. Fantastic, that is awesome. Um, I, I popped in and I asked, uh, you know, tell me about your other, um, other resources. Uh, Linda Minihan is already using the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go, um, and, and then everyone at the Extension office. So um, that's great too. So, um, and then Mindy put in the farmtoschool.org resources as well. So there's some, there are some great resources out there. Um, and, it, and I think that us coming together and sharing kind of as a youth gardening team is a good way to, to learn about those as we go forward. So, and, and one of the other things to Mindy um, putting in the farm to school uh, dot org um, website and the resources there, uh, farm to school, the national farm to school network with the USDA there, you know, they work really collaboratively and there is a focus, at least in the Southeast region, I know that there's a focus on, um, on farm to school as like a primary focus of the USDA. Um, it really, last year, last year when Wendy and I went to that conference, it was like the last conference I went to. Um, but before that, I had gone to a meeting with the Southeast Regional Office and uh, the USDA, and they're very, very focused on um, farm to school. So anything that we can do to support that, I think is beneficial for our state and overall. Good, Good. okay, everyone. Uh, we have built in a little break for us right now, about a, about a 30 minute break. This is to check your emails, um, to go get some chocolate or espresso or your Mountain Dew or whatever um, caffeinated beverage you want. Uh, because Lisa from Texas A&M is joining us at 3.30. And um, so don't log out, just hang in there with us and um, come back. 
um, right about maybe three, uh, 325. And um, because we, she's our rock star, she's super high energy and she's gonna talk to us about learn, grow, eat, go. I think I said it right. And we're gonna really enjoy her presentation. So this is what we've been waiting for all day. It's gonna be awesome, but I hope that you're enjoying the in-service. I know that I am. I'm just really uh, happy with the exchange of ideas that we've had so far. So we'll see you in about 25 minutes and we will um, see, um, see Lisa Witzley um, present on the special junior master gardener program. See you then, okay? 25 minutes.
You made it. Are you in Durham, North Carolina? I am in Durham, North Carolina. Yes, I am. <laughs> in is the it, rain. <laughs> is it rainy there today? Pouring. We've been in the rain every single day. It's crazy. It followed you all the way, huh? It followed us the entire way. Yes. Can you hear me okay, Wendy? Perfectly. Nice and loud. Just okay. like just like okay. normal, Lisa. Just like normal, Lisa. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> So that's good. So we took a little bio break, a little screen break for people to maybe catch up on their emails, et cetera. And then uh, we're going to get back started right around uh, right around three o'clock or three thirty. Sorry. OK, perfect. No, that's good. Um, so I'm going to uh, mute myself and do a and do a couple little things and I'll be right back. OK, sounds great. Um, Lisa, do you want to um, practice sharing or do you want to go ahead and share? I can. Just okay. A second. Um, because my Zoom professional is leaving and I just want to make sure we can make this happen before she walks out the door. Okay. Um, let me see. Share screen. All right, let me get my PowerPoint up. Looks good. Perfect. Good, good. Okay. Do I look like I'm, is it, can you see okay? We I'm can trying see. to get where I'm not. not it's in real shadow, but. You're not in the dark. It's nice. Okay, and, um, perfect. <laughs> You're in good shape. Well, wow. it looks like y'all had a fun agenda. Y'all did some activities and we, stuff. We did, we did. We made a, I gotta show you my, this is my know and show sombrero. Nice, so, very nice. <laughs> we did that online. So that was fun. And then I have my, my plant person. There he is. Oh, look how great. He, I, wow, it's really grown out, Wendy. Look at that. I know. Well, it's COVID. You know, we don't get our hair cut as often. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see I what else it. we made. Um, we made a bug sucker and um, folks went out and some folks caught ants. Uh, and then we also made a metamorphosis bracelet. Nice. So nice. we had. So we've got on. There are agents um, all across Florida. Yes, uh, literally all across Florida, from uh, Key West all the way up to the Georgia border. So um, nice. And from the Atlantic to the Atlantic side to the Gulf side. So we really have crossed all over. And um, we have a combination of 4-H agents. Um, horticulture agents and FNP um, professionals with us. Okay, good. And, you know, we had really, really hoping to um, foster collaboration between the three uh, entities. And I think we've done a really good job of that. Um, the uh, raised bed gardening class was excellent. The uh, hydroponics class was excellent as well as the um, earth box class really gave us some real good ideas about what 
what we can do to grow um, in the in the schools and and in the after school programs. So that was great. And we learned a little bit about evaluation and um, we learned how to foster leadership and partnership with your master gardener volunteers. Um, did that first thing in the morning. And really, yeah, we did some good stuff today. Um, covered a lot of ground. Well, and I'll try, to, I'll try to touch on some of those things too and kind of give some, I don't know, lessons learned mm -hmm. <laughs> and things that we've gone through that we found were you know, were helpful for us um, as we kind of went through that process too, so. Good. One of the questions we had earlier is about Learn, Grow, Eat, Go, um, what age uh, or grades are targeted with that curriculum? Um, it's, it's targeted to elementary school. Um, when it was part of the full research study, um, we did it at third and fourth grade. Okay. Um, we do, um, have a lot of schools that are doing it maybe second through fifth grade, but um, I would say the majority kind of fall on that second through fifth grade okay. range. But Good. for the grant proposal that we did and the longitudinal study, it was third and fourth grade. So okay. some of the data and research that I'll share from that early on was for third and fourth grade because we followed those kids for two years. Well, we're excited to hear about the outcomes of that or the um, what your findings were. And we talked a little earlier about how that, you know, that third and fourth grade are just so fun to work with because they're, oh, yeah. they're curious, they're excited, and they're not cool yet. <laughs> it's, it, it, yes. And, and I'll share a little bit at the end. I think I told you we have an early childhood Learn, Grow, Go that's coming out in August. So I'll share a little bit about that because I know that, um, we piloted it in a lot of states and we have a lot of our extension professionals that are working with early child care centers and Head Start programs and things like that. So it, it may be a nice addition to some of the things that they may already be doing. Sure. Something more in their arsenal because you never know what, exactly who's going to be on the other end of that phone when it rings. So. And, and you just tell me, Wendy, too, that you can see everything. You know what I'm saying? Because working on a laptop, sometimes it's hard to see. You know, I'm used to having two screens going. I so I know. That was one of the main reasons I returned to the office um, a little bit early during COVID was because um, I need my two screens, especially when you're doing Zooms a lot, you know. Um, I did. We did a, our state master gardener conference, I guess it was a week and a half ago, and it was virtual. We had 950 master gardeners. Wow. And we had five different Zoom rooms. We had one, the agency Zoom room we used for our keynote presentations. Then we had breakout rooms, um, and it worked so well. I mean, it was unbelievable. And, you know, the master gardeners just they they really I think they've gotten a little more comfortable with that and it worked great we had amazing speakers and we had breakout rooms at the end of each breakout each session you know so they could chat and have some discussion it worked really well I mean the survey our state master gardener coordinator did is I think 85 percent of them said that they would go to another all virtual conference which Wow. You, know, you think about our travel budgets and stuff like that. It's nice to know they're willing to do that, right? right. Um, did, did they charge? We did. It was like 50, 50 or $55, yeah. um, but it worked great. Um, you know, and they love that too, because they didn't have to pay for, a lot of them were on fixed incomes. They didn't have to pay for travel and stuff like that. So yeah, it worked really good. Terrific. Well, maybe we'll have you come talk to ours in October. We are still needing some speakers. So that would be great to, to maybe talk to the we're master gardeners. Virtual. Yep, we're doing 100% virtual because I would have had to sign the contract back in February and we just, yeah. we couldn't do it. No, we couldn't do it. So, 
Well, everybody, um, we're getting close to time, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get us started. So hopefully, I told them to return about 325, so hopefully everyone is back. Uh, Y'all, I'm just so thrilled that we have Lisa Whittlesey, Whittlesey uh, joining us today. She is from Texas A&M. She has been at Texas A&M since 1989. If you do the math, that's over 30 years. And ask me how I know that because I started at UF in 1989 also, so um, been around a while. So um, she has been the um, Master Gardener, Junior Master Gardener Coordinator since 1999, and she is the co-author on the uh, curriculum, uh, the curricula that has been uh, released from Texas A&M, wildly popular um, across the United States and even internationally. And it's just uh, kind of the, the benchmark of uh, youth gardening curricula and the program that's out there. And we're just thrilled that she can uh, zoom in and be with us today. And uh, Lisa, we're just so happy that you're here and we would, uh, we're would we dying to hear what you have to say about Learn, Grow, Eat, Grow and um, learning about um, a little bit more about youth gardening. So thank you and welcome. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I, I did say that Wendy shared some of the know and show sombreros and the plant people and things that you did. I love that. <laughs> Glad you guys got to, to do that. Um, I'm pleased to be here today um, to share just some things about the Junior Master Gardener program, but more specifically about Learn, Grow, Eat, Go. And just to share, I would say some things that we've learned through this process. So as you guys start thinking about how you might could use a program like this in Florida, um, you know, kind of the good and the bad and the ugly and what, what worked for us and kind of some best practices uh, maybe for you to think about. Um, I, I grew up doing 4-H and youth development. Um, my dad was actually a county extension agent and I was a state 4-H officer. So I, I kind of lead extension um, and the 4-H and youth development program. Our mission for Junior Master Gardener is really about growing good kids. And we're using horticulture as a platform to be able to do that, for them to learn and to be successful and to learn to give back to their community. Um, specifically, and Wendy kind of mentioned it, the JMG program, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary this past year. Um, we're in all 50 states and in 10 countries, and we have state-level junior master gardener coordinators in 38 of our um, land-grant institutions, and we've got international partners. Um, we've done projects with Peace Corps and the Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture and, and several um, National Guard projects overseas as well. So lots of, lots of activity for sure. Y'all probably, it looked like y'all went through a little bit of some of the Junior Master Gardener curricula. Uh, we have core curricula for elementary school and middle school. And then we have some thematic curricula that are built around specific themes. So uh, Wildlife Gardener, which grow, uh, is built around growing for habitat. Uh, Literature in the Garden, which features six children's um, novels and books and has gardening lessons that go with those. And then our nutrition-based curricula that really integrates nutrition and gardening and physical activity, which is learn, grow, eat, go. And then we actually have our early childhood learn, grow, eat, go curricula that's coming out in August. So I'll share a little bit about that um, at the end of my presentation. Um, we do have the curricula circled in, in orange in Spanish. And so we have a lot of our resources um, in Spanish. They're, they're completely translated in Spanish. And a lot of the take-home messaging for parents and parent letters and things like that that are also in Spanish as well. So what are some of the benefits for the JMG program? And, and I know that, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of extension people. We're asked always to validate the impact of our programs, right? Um, and so these are some of the research studies that have been done on the JMG program in general um, by graduate and uh, master's and PhD students. And we had some that looked at leadership and personal responsibility. Um, academic achievement, particularly in science. We had a student looking at 
parent and mentor involvement with schools that had JMG program, and we saw increases in all of those areas. Um, another thing that it's a great exposure to career pathways. So introducing uh, children to opportunities for career pathways, getting in them involved in doing community service, and then opportunities for them to be certified as junior master gardeners. Um, we have a lot of those research citations that are on our website, jmgkids.us slash research if you're interested in those. And then I'll speak a little bit more specifically on some of our research on Learn, Grow, Eat, Go um, in just a minute. Um, the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go curricula was part of a USDA AFRI Research and Extension Grant project. And we partnered with the Texas A&M um, School of Public Health and Health Science Center and the University of Texas School of Public Health and Health Science Center. Well, I mean, you know, A&M and UT at Tex in Texas, those are the big rival schools, right? Um, but we came together and partnered and it was such a strong partnership and, and working with Extension to really evaluate our Extension program. So we evaluated the Junior Master Gardener Learn, Grow, Eat, Go curricula, as well as our walking program, which in Texas we call Walk Across Texas that our family and community health really promoted as um, both corporate wellness and community and worksite wellness, but also wellness programs that, that families can do or schools can do. So we looked at evaluating those programs. It was a longitudinal study. We had children that participated in third grade and we did pre-tests the beginning of third grade at the, and then we did a post-test the end of fourth grade, and then we followed them for a full year afterwards to look at impact. So, y'all, we've never had money <laughs> to do that level of research, and we did height and weight and BMI collections at all those data points. So, um, that was really wonderful to have that level of evaluation. We also um, did parent evaluations for the students that were um, in the program, and the researchers did parent analysis between those. So a lot of great data that came from that. These were all Title I funded schools, um, some in urban areas like Dallas and Houston, and some in a little more smaller school districts like Corpus Christi and a few of our rural districts. So these were some of the significant um, behavioral outcomes that we saw. Um, we saw increase in moderate to vigorous physical activity and overall total physical activity. We saw increases in vegetable consumption and preferences, meaning they were willing to try new vegetables um, and choosing healthy beverage preferences. So things like choosing water over sugar sweetened drinks. Um, increases in self-efficacy and knowledge related to both gardening and nutrition concepts. And then the thing that our family community health folks were so excited about is really looking at increases in reach into the home. So parents and children cooking together, doing more physical activity together and gardening together. Those were all things that we were really excited about. And we did see a statistically significant uh, reduction in BMI or body mass index for those children that participated um, in, the, in the program. So we were really excited about that. We do have a number of publications um, that have been published related to this research. Uh, the most recent one was in Childhood Obesity Journal. Um, so we have, I think, most of those up, um, citations up to date. If you're interested, we have them on the main research site, and we also have them in the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go section of our website. So um, those are things that we were really excited about. So I wanted you to kind of get an overview about the curricula itself. I, I, I can't take you through all of it in a short period of time, but just to kind of give you a flavor of some of the things that are covered. Um, Learn, Grow, Eat, Go is not just the title, but it's how it's divided. And so there's a learn section, there's a grow section, there's an eat section, and there's a go section. So the learn is the academic lessons that the students are learning, and it really integrates 
um, academic lessons that are tied to math and science and social studies and language arts, gardening, nutrition, and health. Um, so those are things that are in that learn section. Growing, we want the kids to grow vegetables, okay? And most of our groups do raise beds, but we do have some groups that do container gardens. The most important thing though is there's definitely a correlation with them growing it and having a willingness to taste and trust. So we want them to grow it because it gives them multiple exposures to those vegetables. And then we want them to eat it, okay? So there are several different ways that we look at providing that to them, um, both as individual fresh samples and then garden kitchen recipes. And we've actually worked a lot with our school districts to work with the nutrition service staff so that they can offer some of these same vegetables during the, the school year, particularly when they're studying it in class for our school program. And then if it's more individual activity, um, we want um, the kids to be active, active. active. One of the things that's helped us from implementing that is that many of our, many of our teachers, teachers have taken on have the role. On the role. And that's helped. I will our school um, grade level teachers, grade level teachers feel like they're, they're not having to have to all the time. And the teachers have the teachers have to take care of their assignment. Hey, also hey done Lisa, also during your sound just got um, a little uh, crunchy. So I just um, let's see if we maybe can improve your sound. And maybe to do that, you might have to stop your video. Okay, try to speak now. Hello. You're you're there, but I'm I'm still having a hard time hearing you. Hang on a second. Okay, that's better. Okay, perfect. Sorry. <laughs> okay, you did good. You're good again. Okay. Let me get. All right. Can you hear me okay now, Wendy? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. Um, so the learn section is 10 weeks long and there's two lessons per week. So there's 20 total lessons and they are aligned to academic standards. Most of our programs are offered through schools. I would say probably 75% of our programs. So we knew that it would work great for after school or community based 4 H clubs, but for schools to use it, it had to be tied to those academic standards. Um, we have garden journals for the students. There's math and con contained within the ki garden kitchen recipes, as well as there's writing and literature connections through books um, and less within the lessons. Uh, there's family engagement resources that we have and opportunities for children to get service learning and share what they've done with others and to get certification. We wanted the kids to grow the vegetables. And I will tell you if we have any nutrition folks on the line, um, this was a pretty big point of discussion as to what vegetables we wanted the children to grow because we wanted to be sure they were nutrient dense, but we also horticulturally wanted something that could grow within the school period of the school year period of time. And that would be fun for the kids to grow. And, and the biggest one that, that gave our nutrition folks um, a little bit of concern was potatoes. And I said, yeah, but if you've ever grown potatoes with children, they love it. It's so exciting for them. And they finally decided, you know, potatoes are an inexpensive vegetable. It's one that does well. Does well. And that we just and they often prepare it in unpaired ways. And so maybe it's so maybe not be with some recipes and recipes on a more healthy way. So that's why. Uh, we wanted kids to have multiple exposures to the vegetables. So we wanted them to grow them. And then we wanted them to try a fresh sample in the classroom. And then we wanted them to actually do a recipe. And sometimes 
that recipe demonstration might be something that our family and community health agents would lead. Um, it could be a volunteer that's trained to lead it. Um, sometimes we had our teachers that led it. And in some counties, we had trained master gardeners that actually extension trained them to get their food handlers license and they did the training. So um, a lot of different ways those recipe demos um, were done, but the kids loved that. Um, the Go Strong part was the physical activity. So we had um, kind of brain breaks and fun things that they could do to kind of get them active in the classroom, as well as we encouraged them to participate in the Walk Across Texas program. And y'all may have something similar um, in your state that you do that is a, a walking or a physical activity program. So um, it pairs really nicely with Learn, Grow, It, Go. So I would encourage you to think about that um, if you have it. Um, so again, it's 10 weeks, two lessons per week. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility on how quickly they might go through it. Um, but what we did ask is that they tried to teach them in order because there is a sequencing that goes with um, the lessons and they build upon each other. Um, so this shows kind of an overview of the base curricula. And you can see where the purple arrows are. That was kind of the ideal time within the structure of the curricula when to start your garden. So we started with, you know, what do plants need to grow? And then we get into growing the garden. And then what do the vegetables give us? And how did they help our bodies to grow? Okay, so that kind of builds on, on one another. We want to introduce them to try the different vegetables that they're growing, okay? So here's an example with carrots, might be introduced in week one. They may be growing it, but we want them to taste it, okay? And that could be easily done at first with just getting little baby carrots. And if they want, try them by themselves. A little bit of dressing may help with that, um, but that's fun. And then they can do a garden kitchen recipe featuring carrots. And so the one that's in the curricula was um, cinnamon carrot crunch. Um, and it's real simple. We looked at things that didn't require a lot of prep time, um, but also would be something maybe the kids could replicate at home. And then our Go Strong lessons, okay? So that gives you a little bit of an overview of the curricula at a glance. Um, we put on there, start walk across Texas. That's when we kind of encourage in the second week to, to really get our, our kids involved in the walking program, um, as well as doing those Go Strong lessons. So I wanted to show you just a couple of the lessons within the curricula so you can kind of see what it looks like. Wendy, give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me. I'll just say we can still hear you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So y'all did know and show sombrero, so that's one that's featured in here because it's fun and it introduces the kids to what plants need to be able to grow. And y'all probably use that acronym P-L-A-N-T-S. That's a great way for the kids to remember they need a place to grow, they need light, they need air, they need nutrients, they get thirsty, so they need water, and they need soil, okay? So that's one, that's the very first lesson that we include, um, and it's simple, and it's a way for them to kind of graphically represent things that plants need. The second lesson is one called Five Senses Food, and it just introduces the concept of we don't just eat with how things visually look, but it's also how it smells, the texture in our mouth, um, all the different senses, and taste is just one of those. And those of you working with children know that sometimes texturally, um, vegetables, they may have a real... Um, um, distaste for certain vegetables because it's a texture thing, right? Um, so in the journal pages is the time that we did vegetable tastings, raw vegetable tasting. So here's an example at the bottom of a journal page. And we start with carrots 
just because that's an easy one that most of the time you can get those little baby carrots and it's easy to start with. And they have to, this lesson takes them through um, how we evaluate different foods and that, you know, we may have an aversion to what it looks like, but it may smell good. It may feel good in our mouth. It may have an interesting sound when we bite it. So you take th through each of those individual senses and they rank them. Well, why do we do this during journal time? Because during journal time, it's quiet, okay? And the teacher will take them through this lesson and they evaluate it and they'll be very um, objective about it and quiet and not say, oh, that's gross, you know, because they're really trying to think about each individual sense while they're doing it. And I was at one of our test schools and this young man, he was, he was thinking and he was tasting and I said, is everything okay? And he goes, well, I'm going to take another bite and give it another chance. <laughs> Oh, that was great, right? That's exactly what we wanted. And so getting them to think about evaluating their foods. So here's an example of the garden journal page that goes with that first week. Um, it highlights some of the things that the students learned with the know and show sombreros. It has the opportunities for them to, to think about seeds and use describing words as far as what plants look like when they grow up and how that plant might be useful for them. And the first week we put on their carrots for tasting, but for all the other weeks, it can be any vegetable that you choose um, that's, that's part of the, the curricula or things that you're growing. But the journal pages we have as PDF downloads from our website. Or we do have them where they're saddle stitched and you can actually buy the little complete journals um, put together in classroom sets of 25. So uh, we have a lot of groups that prefer that. So you'll see there's week one, kind of the time frame and the time commitment um, and how the lessons build on one another and how the journal page goes with that. Um, so I wanted to just show a couple of other lessons, and we can't go through all of them, but just to give you a flavor, we introduce plant parts that we eat, that a lot of plants, we eat different parts of the plant, and the literature connection for this one is a book called Tops and Bottoms, and if you haven't read this book, it's a Caldecott winning book. It's amazing. Um, a lot of your libraries are going to have the books um, probably already. But if they don't, we worked with the publishers and we have all of the books that are featured in Learn, Grow, Go available through the AgriLife bookstore that you can purchase as a package if you don't already have them. So check with your um, schools, check with your schools, schools because have they may already, already have them. So Tops and Bottoms is a great story and it introduces the parts of the plant we eat. And so here's an example of that particular lesson. And it talks about the different plant parts. So they have roots and stems and leaves and flowers and fruits and seeds. And we actually have a little song that goes to that, that goes to the Adams family um, that's kind of fun. And then we have kids think about categorizing different vegetables by the plant part that we eat. And so they go through that process and think about different plants and what plant part do we actually eat? Um, and so there's some of them that the kids are actually putting on the board. And, you know, they learn that green beans, that, that we eat the fruit, which is actually the pod, right, the, the pea pod, and we eat the seeds that are inside, right? So having them think about all the different plant parts that they eat and that many plants have more than one part that is edible. Um, another lesson I wanted to share with you, just because this is a little more horticultural in nature and a great math lesson, is paper towel gardening. Um, this is kind of before the kids plant their vegetables, and it's thinking about how much space a vegetable is going to take up. And so they are going to make a planting template that they could actually plant out in the garden. So this introduces spacing. And they're going to think about a paper towel. And here's an example with carrots. 
And we have a, a sheet that goes on there that tells how many seeds per paper towel or basically square foot that you would need. So for carrots, they need 16 seeds per paper towel. So this is a great fraction lesson because they have to fold it to get 1 16th. And then if they use washable school glue, they can actually glue that seed in the middle of each of those squares. And most of the time, the teachers will have them put their name on it. They'll put the vegetable and then they'll look on the seed packet to see how deep they need to plant the vegetable. And then you take those directly into the garden. You can lay them on top of the, your garden bed. The kids can rearrange them to see how they want them to be. And then they can actually use a pencil and put markings on it so they know how to deep to plant it and just press that down into the soil. And then it's perfectly spaced and then you can water it in. Um, it works really great. A lot of times when we lay them on the soil, we'll wet them first because it makes it a little easier for planting but it works great. This is a planting chart that's in the curricula and notice that first um, there's carrots. So it tells like how long before the seeds usually emerge and the number of seeds per paper towel. But notice that planting date is empty. And that's because the planting dates really vary, right? Um, where you are in the United States and even for you guys, y'all are kind of like we are in Texas that you know, up in the panhandle of Texas, I mean, they're planting so much later because it gets so much colder than it does down in the lower Rio Grande Valley where it's almost tropical. So really varies. And a great way to introduce extension as a resource. Um, this is a lesson on having the kids be a part of deciding where the vegetable garden is going to go. So the book is called Home Sweet Home. And it has a great kind of literature connection that goes with it. And having the kids be a part of helping pick the vegetable site. And sometimes you don't always have that as an option because your, um, your area, the school or group may say it must be here. And, and I tell you, still have the kids go on two other sites that maybe are not as desirable and have them go through that process because it helps them to feel ownership to the garden. And then they evaluate the site. And so they're going to rank each of these categories from one being the poorest and five being the best. And then they'll add up the scores for each site and location. Um, there's some great technical writing that can come with this where if they tell me it has a five because it's near a water source. Well, some great science teaks would be what evidence do you have, right? to show that it's near a water source. So they might have to measure it to actually see the distance. So all sorts of things that they can do to be a part of that process. Um, a lot of the curricula, you'll see these taking it further that may pull in some even more academic standards, particularly for math and science with certain lessons. <coughs> Pardon me. Of course, we start getting into a lot of the nutrition information. So we introduced my plate and that half of our plate is fruits and vegetables and how important fruits and vegetables are to our diet. And we want kids to understand that and to think about creating their own my plate and what they eat and that really to strive for half of their plate to be fruits and vegetables. The grow section, y'all, this can be scary for teachers getting started. It's like, holy moly, where do I start with the garden? We want it to be simple and easy, quick to put up and inexpensive. And so we actually put together a little garden template. Um, they don't have to do a raised bed, but we found that this size works pretty good. This is a three foot by seven foot raised bed. And it allows for, you have three different plots of a vegetable going down it. And so a lot of our schools really like this because it's pretty simple and they can do 
um, those six different vegetables. And then they leave one part that's a kid's choice. So it might be herbs that they could feature with it, or it might be an additional vegetable, um, but that works pretty well. <clears throat> and then we even put together an outline that shows them how to put the bed together. Um, this is a downloadable PDF from the Junior Master Gardener website. We have a video that goes with this, and we actually have a teacher going to Home Depot and picking out the supplies herself, right? Because they'll cut the boards for them and all that. And that just, I think, takes away a little bit of the mystery of how to get started and has worked pretty well for our groups. So we tell them how many screws to get, what size of screws, how to put it together, how to do the corners. And this is a great way that you can involve some of your Master Gardener volunteers with this process. Um, a lot of our schools will use bagged soil. You don't have to if you have a good source for bulk soil, but I will tell you, it's a little easier to manage um, as far as carrying and loading and unloading than with bulk soil. And then sometimes, depending on your source, the bulk soil can have a lot of weed seeds and that can be problematic. So, you know, know your area and maybe visit with your ag and natural resource or horticulture agent um, and master gardeners to help with that. <clears throat> We want the kids to have an understanding for what each of those vegetables um, do for their body. And so there's a particular lesson that introduces, number one, that our garden is a tool not only for us to learn, but others. And so they label their garden vegetables. They also put a nutrient stone in there that tells what that nutrient comes from that particular vegetable. So this is one they did for carrots, vitamin A. What does vitamin A do? It's really good for our, our eyesight and for night vision. And so these are some markers that the kids did in their garden to be more of a display or an educational garden, not just for their class, but for the whole grade level in school. Okay. Oops. I'll see if I can go back. Um, if you don't have the little stones or broken sticks, we had a lot of groups that have used the paint, the paint stirs and permanent markers. So, you know, whatever would work for you um, is great. We partnered, and I don't know um, how many of you um, are familiar with the CATCH program. A lot of our schools use the coordinated approach to child health. Um, as a as wellness program at, at campuses. And one of the catch um, slogans is go slow and whoa. And so we tried to really promote that, that, you know, that we didn't want them thinking, okay, this is a good food or a bad food, but there are some foods that are go, go foods. We can eat a lot of them. They are, they're high in nutrients, they're low in fat, they're low in sugar. So that makes them a go food. There's some foods that are slow, meaning they have a little bit more of those other things. And then there are some foods that are woe foods. And there's actually, um, you know, a great diagram that goes with this because there may be a food like a grape. If you're eating it fresh, it may be a go food, right? If you're eating it as a juice, it may be a slow food. If it may be a woe food, if it's in a real sweet jam or jelly, okay? So having them think about how it's prepared um, is something that we try to get across. Here's a lesson um, that is a great history lesson and it introduces um, Thomas Jefferson and what a great gardener he was. And it's about growing potatoes and it has a children's book that goes with it called Two Old Potatoes and Me, um, but it introduces the idea of reading food labels. And this has a grid, and you can see the young lady with the grid, and we take a cup of baked chips and put it in as, um, on top of the grid with a Ziploc bag and a cup of regular chips 
And then we have them mush it and pound it. And then after one minute, they look. And can you guys see all of those grease marks on there? And they count those. And it's a way for them to really visually see, wow, how much um, a difference it can make on how the food is prepared. And looking at those labels and, and having an understanding of that. They love this lesson. It's really fun. So here's what the kids did. They actually did graphs and they counted the number of grits that had grease on them. And wow, it made a big difference to them because they could visually see it when they held it up to the light. So um, greasy grid evaluation, simple, but it helped to get the point across. We want kids to have an opportunity for food exposures. This is one of our 4-H um, agents. Um, that was doing some recipe demonstrations with kids. And, you know, we introduced in that Five Senses Food the idea of those fresh samples, okay? So we, we try to really allow the kids to try it fresh, but we also want them to try it in a recipe. The recipes we have in English and Spanish, um, English on one side, Spanish on the other side, um, this is great if you have got your family and community health agent or master wellness volunteers or master gardeners that maybe have their food handlers license to help to lead these recipe demonstrations. Um, you'll notice in here, do y'all see this, the garden kitchen math? There's a lot of great math that can be taught in food preparation, okay? So, you know, think about if it, the recipe calls for a cup of something. Well, what if you don't have a one cup measure? What if you have only a one quarter cup measure? So it gives the volunteer or person leading this recipe demonstrations things they can ask the children as they go through it that may pull in additional math um, academic standards to support that. So we have the food label for all of these different recipes. We do have videos of these on the JMG website. Um, in many of our school districts, we've partnered with nutrition services for the school districts for them to be involved with this. Um, Houston ISD has about a quarter of a million children um, in it, and we work with Houston ISD Nutrition Services, and one of their chefs does a lot of programming with us. And she goes and does these recipe demonstrations. And we actually have videos of her helping to teach that. We have about 20 schools, elementary schools in HISD that are doing Learn, Grow, Eat, Go now. And we work with nutrition services on that. So one of the things we found is that lots of um, our educators and teachers, if they're going to do a fresh sample like how do you cut a bell pepper? Or how do you cut Swiss chard? Or how do you prepare it? So we have a lot of images and pictures on how to cut it, how to wash it, how to select it, how to cut it, how to store it, um, just things to kind of help. Um, not only so that they know how much, maybe, how much maybe, but how to get it ready. So this might be helpful if you um, had others that were helping on the food prep side for, for groups to be able to taste and try. So you can see on here, uh, it gives them an idea that one bite size sample is enough for 20 students and you'll need about three medium leaves for us to do that with Swiss chart. Okay, so we have that for each vegetable. Um, I mentioned Walk Across Texas. If you guys, uh, y'all can do Walk Across Texas, even if you're not from Texas. Um, they, we have a lot of out-of-state groups that use our platform, um, and you don't, it doesn't have to be literally Walk Across Texas. Y'all can walk across Florida if you don't have your own, but um, it, it is a nice interactive platform if you need that. So, I mentioned the Go Strong um, sections. That's just like little quick things that students could do um, with teachers or with volunteers for some additional physical activity just to get their brain going. The research really shows that if they get some blood flow, that they're uh, ready to learn, that they're able to learn better and retention is better. So uh, we always like to include that. Okay, Wendy. I'm I'm afraid to open the chat because I'm not sure that 
my <laughs> that my PowerPoint will be. Are there any questions right now that maybe I should address? I uh, I don't see any questions just yet, but Linda is raising her hand. Linda, what's your question? And Lisa, let's try your video. Uh, I think I think your sound is better now. Okay. Yes, yes, I can't Linda. hear you. I can't hear you yet, Linda. No, ma'am. Why don't you go ahead and chat? No. <laughs> Not yet. Technology is great sometimes. <laughs> Linda, why don't you just type it in? Yeah, and if you can just give it to me, Wendy, I'll go and then when, okay. I'll take a little break and you can okay. let sure. me know. Um, sure. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about building school and community support. I feel like this is really important. Um, and I'll share with you some of the lessons we've learned in this process that has kind of helped us. We really have thought about Learn, Grow, Ego as really um, a very interdisciplinary opportunity for our county programs to not only partner with a lot of people in the community, but also within our county. Um, that, that's something our, our 4-H agents, our FNAP, our family and community health agents, our ag and natural resource and horticulture agents, and our volunteers can all be a part of. Um, we've worked with school districts, both through nutrition services, as well as teachers, community organizations. Um, we've worked with the school district at the district level. And then if you have school health advisory committees um, at your campuses, they also can be a great support for this effort as you start to work together. Um, one of the things you'll find in Learn, Great, Go is there was a purposeful effort because it's something we were evaluating is that family engagement. So there's weekly parent letters to go home. And it's an opportunity for parents to really be engaged in what their children's learning at school. Uh, we have those in English and in Spanish. We have family recipes that go home. Okay, you can print those from the website, or if you don't want to mess with printing them, we have them bundled as 25 copies for each recipe. Um, but we know we had a third of the families, then these were Title I schools, that said they made the recipe at home. Okay, well, that meant the child had to get the recipe in the backpack. It had to go home. They had to convince the parent to grow the vegetables and or buy the things. So we were really excited about that. We also have opportunities for parents to volunteer. So there's a, a letter in there that you can adapt that at the beginning of the school year, you know, my child, your child is going to participate in the, the Learn, Grow, Eat, Go program at your school. Would you like to be involved? And it has different ways that parents might become engaged. Another thing that we tried to do is we did a lot of layering of programs. So for your family and community health educators that may be online, if y'all have other programs, so cooking programs. In Texas, we have a program called Dinner Tonight. That's basically how to cook. Um, we had gardening programs. We had physical activity programs. We had some other uh, do well, be well with diabetes. We had a, a lot of our health and wellness suite of programs that we tried to layer and offer um, at campuses that were doing Learn Great Go. And, and I would encourage you to think about that because that has been really um, an effective way for us to really um, improve impact um, at the family level. And also we looked at doing celebration events at the campus. So big deal on building the garden or when the kids got their certification at the end. Um, or they might have a, a, a special day when they're doing, you know, recipe demonstrations where parents may be involved. Um, you'll see at the back of the curricula, there's a little exclamation point. There's just a lot of resources that are in there to kind of help. Um, one thing is ideas for the kids to be involved in leadership and community service projects. 
And again, this relates back to our 4 H and Youth Development Program. We want kids to learn about giving back and being able to give back through their gardening experience. Um, there is an example of letters to parents. You know, your, your child's about to participate in this program. Would you like to be involved? And how could you participate? So we have these available on the website. You can download them. You can use those as a starting point for your own. But we felt like this was a good way to engage to parents and parents. And then those weekly update letters of in English and in Spanish that really went over your child learning and, and the questions that they might ask them about. Hang on just a minute, Lisa. We're, we're losing you again. So maybe... Um... Maybe stop sharing your screen. Okay, good. Or stop sharing your video. Thank you. Yes or no? Yes or no? It's getting better. All right. Sounds better. Okay, good. All right, one thing that I think you will find as helpful is we have a sample volunteer schedule. And for those of you that may work with 4-H volunteers or Master Gardener volunteers or Master Wellness volunteers, it's, it's showing week by week task that you might can solicit volunteer support to help with. And we found that a lot of our extension employees uh, found this to be helpful. Um, a lot of our teachers found it to be helpful. And for some of our master gardeners, they might not be available to help with the entire program, but they might say, you know what, I could come on week four and assist with the garden build and planting, okay? Or I might could help on this particular week and do this thing. And so something to think about as you look at volunteers and how you might engage them one thing that we do have is um, on our website um, for Learn, Grow, Go under Cooperative Extension, there's a county extension toolkit that's there, and it has kind of roles that different county extension agent disciplines could have to support the program, but it also has volunteer descriptions and roles and responsibilities. So that may be helpful for you as you recruit volunteers or train volunteers to work with the program. Um, we really spend a lot of time on training of volunteers to help them to model how you want them to implement the program. We had a lot of our master gardeners that we told them, your job is not to do it for the children. And I think we have a tendency, some of our master gardeners, they want to go in there and do it. And we're like, our job is to teach them how to do it. It's like when your child learns to tie their shoe. If you tie their shoe for them all the time, they don't, know, learn, they don't learn how to do it. And so it's having them learn how to do that on their own. And so um, trying to train our volunteers to, to support in those ways and be more mentors and teachers and not the ones just leading and doing um, is pretty important. We also looked at some program costs, and this was helpful because some of our county programs, we have about 120 county programs in Texas that use Learn, Grow, Eat, Go and get SNAP ad funding to support it. So it helps them to kind of plan for their budget um, on what they might need for building a garden and for supplies for food demonstrations and you know, books and curricula and, and, and supplies and things like that. Um, so I just put that on there because we found that that can be helpful for some of our counties and schools. Um, how these are funded, um, we have a lot of our schools that fund it through their school budget. Um, the teachers uh, may get training by extension uh, to, to lead and do the program and get curricula as part of that training. Um, and they're ready to go. We have a number of our nutrition services that help support it because of the Tata nutrition. Um, for extension, as I mentioned, we have about 120 of our programs in Texas that get SNAP ad funding through AgriLife Extension to hire employee and to help support with purchasing seeds and transplants and recipe 
you know, demonstration supplies and curricula and all sorts of things. And then, of course, PTA, local businesses and organizations um, have been involved with supporting funding. Uh, we even have several groups that have gotten farm to school grants and things like that to support their programs um, as well. I wanted to share a little bit of what we do as far as assessment um, in Texas. We had, um, you know, it was a very heavily researched program. So we had research surveys that were already vetted. They were already tested for reliability and validity. And so we use those survey instruments and, and tweak them and pick the questions that we wanted to kind of look at program impact. So this is the one we did for 2018 to 2019 school year. <laughs> when we got into 2020, everything went crazy, as y'all know, with COVID. So I, I tried to give you a, a snapshot of a year that was a little more complete, but we had um, about 15,500 plus surveys that were completed. 82% um, of our children were seven to 10 year olds. Um, there you can see the demographics of our children that participated. On the survey, we saw that there was increase in vegetable preference for all 12 vegetables, okay? And we saw a 4.2% increase in water consumption. Um, you'll see there were decreases in kids saying they didn't do any physical activities and increases when they said they were doing more hard physical activity. Uh, we also re saw reduction in screen time and we saw increases from pre and post um, for vegetable consumption and fewer kids saying they didn't eat any vegetables. So those were some of the, the positive things that we saw. In looking at the family part, here are some things we saw. There was increases in uh, families planting more seeds or plants at home in vegetable gardens. Um, we saw families washing vegetables before cooking or eating them and picking vegetables from a garden to cook or eat with their family and gardening with family or others in a community or a school garden. And then we wanted to find out a little bit about what the kids felt. And I thought this was really interesting. We had over 67% of the kids felt like that gardening made them a better math or science student. We also saw that over 66% of the kiddos said that it made them want to come to school because of the garden project. Our school districts were really interested in that because they get funding based on attendance. And so this was something they were pretty excited about. Um, they reported that they taught somebody else to make better food choices, often younger siblings, um, maybe in their own home. And 62% of the students said they enjoyed gardening with their family. Um, so those were some positive things. I will tell you, and I'll show a little bit more on our evaluation um, here in a minute, but these are, I just wanted to talk about some kind of um, positive outcomes or lessons learned. Uh, one of the things is we, we try really hard to encourage our county extension programs to develop coalition teams. And by that, we mean as a county program, they work as a team to implement it. So it's, you know, 4-H and it's FNAP and it's SNAP-Ed educators and FCHA educators and all of our horticulturists working together. Um, we found that to get the most impact that really mirrored the, re the full research study, that fidelity of implementation is very important. So we really uh, talk about that with our extension employees to, to work with the schools to implement all the lessons or as many as possible and do them in the order that's presented, okay? So it says 10 weeks, two lessons per week. Some of them spread that out over a whole semester, right? Um, but they teach them sequentially. One of the things we really um, encourage our extension employees to do is to really work with the schools on the evaluation. Um, the pretest, we have to have the pretest done before they start. And we have to have that post-test at the end. And that 
poor reporting or no reporting can impact results. And I'll give an example. Um, this past year, we had a county in Texas, they had 1500 pretests, and they didn't have any post test. Well, when you don't have that, you don't have anything to compare to, you know, and so it's so important that we get those pre and post tests done. And a lot of times, it's agents coordinating with the school to say, hey, could we come to help with this and set up a time to get those kids in the computer lab to be able to do that? And we found that to be helpful. There are a few questions that are recall questions, like what did you eat yesterday kind of questions. Um, we try to encourage our agents to not do the pre or post test on Mondays, okay? Uh, because of that reason, because we really want it dealing with things that they're doing during the school day. Um, we have our evaluation, we have printed ones, um, but we really encourage our extension employees to use a Qualtrics survey. It is so, um, it's so much more engaging for the students. It's got pictures and images. It also has read aloud in both English and in Spanish. So um, you can have a full Spanish uh, Qualtrics survey in print as well as it will read the questions to the to the kids. So um, know that we have that. And Wendy, your folks that work on evaluation, we have shared this with other states. Um, I'm working with, we're doing a statewide training for Mississippi State in August, in July, and they are going to use that Qualtrics and, and, and take that as their template to get started for their program. So just know that that's an option. One of the things, and, and y'all probably have this too, is, you know, we all are evaluated on outcome programs, right, <laughs> and, and what we do. And so understanding that this type of program is really a program that all agents in the county working together can get credit for and participate. And because for you're using a common evaluation tool that it feeds not only to help show what you've done in your county, but it feeds into the statewide report. And our statewide report is something that our extension administration uses with during the legislative session and with key stakeholders to really show impact. And because we're using the same assessment statewide, um, it really helps us. One of the things we try to encourage our extension employees and volunteers is our job is really to train, mentor, and support, but not be the person to deliver the program each week because that really can um, make it not as sustainable. And so we really try hard to support teacher training and volunteer training. Uh, but in most of our campuses, it's the teacher that's leading the program. And our extension employee may be the one reaching out to them. Hey, how's it going this week? They may have updates and things that they're doing, but they're not depending on the extension agent to come in every week and lead the lesson. So, um, and then I mentioned layering of programs uh, being important. Okay, Wendy, tell me, are there any questions? Well, we'll, so we'll find out, we'll find out. But uh, Lisa, you know, the, one of the things that I'm really struck with is that in order for all of these, this integration and this layering, there's got to be communication, you know, and I, um, I'm wondering how you all facilitated the coming together and the collaboration and, and if you have any hints for that. Well, one of the things that we did initially is we did a, a, a kickoff training with counties that were interested and, and our extension administration really supported it. And they sent county teams to be trained. So it wasn't just, you know, the FCH or the SNAP-Ed educators, it was county teams. And it allowed them time together to kind of think about how they were gonna do it. And I think that too, as agents saw that they can all get credit, that it doesn't have to be, oh, this is a 4-H program and I'm not gonna get credit for that, or this is a, you know, an FCH program, I won't get credit for it. And, and it took a while, you know, I mean, it took a while, but I think we really have um, tried to make it a county focused program um, 
where our role is more to train and mentor and support schools because in some of our larger school districts, I mean, we can't be the one going in there leading the train, leading the programs all the time. No. We have to depend on training others to be able to do that, particularly when you talk about large districts like Dallas or San Antonio or right. Houston ISD. I mean, it's just too huge of school districts. And y'all have the same issue, I know. <laughs> so We do. Uh, Lorna Bravo shared with us that Broward County has 270 um, thousand children in their school system. It's like, okay, you know, we, and I feel like we're just a drop in the bucket when we're, you know, meeting with 10 to 15 or 20 schools, but we're making a big difference in those schools. So it's certainly worth doing for sure. And, and I think it's thinking about community partners that you can have in Houston. We didn't have enough master gardener volunteers really and and they didn't feel comfortable going into all the places where some of our schools were located um so we partnered with the houston livestock show and rodeo it's huge they had a large volunteer group that we worked with and we trained them they didn't have gardening expertise so they kind of partnered with our master gardeners to if they had gardening questions but they were young and energetic and wanted to go and do programming with the school so that was a great local partnership and then we've gotten volunteers through community colleges and things like that as well so right right i put our website on here uh, for the specific learn grow eat go section um i will tell you when covid hit and i know y'all had this um a lot of our county programs were what are we going to do we have um every single lesson in a virtual format and we did that during COVID so um, what we did is for each week there's that lesson for no and show sombrero and there's that five senses food lesson and we even did a sharpening science lesson that brought in some more of the academic standards for science and then each week we had a, a bonus feature so it might be a recipe it might be a go strong activity um, it might be a garden um, video and so we did each week 10 weeks four lessons so 40 videos that we had professionally done in our green room for that we have a virtual background that's available on the jmg learn great go website under cooperative extension you can download that and use that if you're doing Zoom sessions with students or with schools. So it's there. Um, here is an example um, of what it looked like. They were very professionally um, done and edited. And we, we tried to really um, do things that could port, support our schools during that time. Um, we took all of those and we have an asynchronous student course that's available now. So if you've got kids that are learning online or kids during the summer, we have that available through our AgriLab online course so they can go through it. The other thing we did is we found, is we found that teachers, even if they were teaching in person, they loved the videos. And so we have all the videos available. So we have a, a CEU course for professional development for teachers that's on our website. And we have this teacher video library that's available for teachers. So a lot of resources that's there. That's there. And I know we're getting to share just quickly our early childhood curricula. This is what it looks like. It's coming in August of 2021. Um, it's built around the, the same pillars of Learn, Grow, Eat, Go. Uh, we've been piloting it. We had about 20 states that had preschool programs that signed up to pilot it. And we got all this review from many teachers that helped to shape the curricula and a lot of other partners um, and land grants that helped with that. Um, these are the different weeks. So it introduces plant needs and parts, and then seeds and roots and stems and leaves and flowers and fruit. And one of the things you'll find is there's lessons, there's small group activities, there's lots of literature connections in books, there's a featured song, and then there's writing journal prompts. So um, 
there it kind of shows for week one, every day, what they'll be doing, the journal prompt, the literature connection, and the things they're doing. Um, here's an example of a garden journal for preschool. It's not as structured <laughs> as it is for our elementary, right? Um, but this is certainly age appropriate for those four and five-year-olds, okay? Um, the underground root table is, was in that first image that I showed, and they learned about tap and fibrous roots. And the sunflower seed head is another one, and I, I think I've got some pictures of it. There's the, the underground root table, and so the kids actually get to crawl under it and touch the roots, and they learn about that some roots are have a big tap root and some roots have a fibrous root system and what that looks like. And that kind of shows how this teacher had that in her classroom through pegboard and pop cleaners. And then she actually brought in samples of real ones so that they could see what they looked like. Um, this was sunflower heads. So they were learning about flowers and fruit and so they made the leaves and there's Play-Doh in the middle and they brought in real sunflower to look at and the kids and then the kids actually got to not here not can't find those sunflowers sunflower sunflowers in the middle in the middle for that particular lesson um you'll see there's list of supplies for each lesson and each day uh, one of the things we really tried to do is um, look at cost saving tips because for many of our preschool programs, the budget is very limited. So, you know, how they could recycle things and how they could do things to, to make it um, even more inexpensive for them to do and for their families. We wanted them to grow stuff just like in the elementary focused. Um, so we chose container gardens because that tend to work well. Um, the kids helped pick where they were going to put those containers. They learned about planting the seeds. They learned about planting transplants. And they were a part of that whole process and helped to water and to harvest. Um, the cooking skills and food exposure. Um, we found all sorts of fun things that kids could do that's age appropriate and tools that they could use to, to help to, to uh, peel and to cut and to be a part of mixing and stirring um, and preparing those. Um, physical activity, the go part, there's a narrative that goes with it. Um, here's an example of them growing like a plant. And she's spraying some water and they're stretching and growing. Um, we have a, a number of songs um, that go with this particular curricula and all the motions that go with it. Um, I sing and play piano, so I usually get involved in the, in the song production side. But it's lots of fun and, and the, the students really love it as well. Parent engagement, we wanted to be really important, just like on the regular elementary focus. So um, a lot of resources and things going home. Um, templates on how you, we could reach families using technology um, and family events as well. One of the things that you'll see with this particular curricula is the alignment not only to the early childhood standards, but the Head Start Early Learning Outcome Framework. And because some of our five-year-olds are in kindergarten, it's also tied to academic um, standards for kindergarten. Um, you'll see that for each week, there's examples for art, blocks, dramatic play, and math centers for the classroom. So a lot of resources that are there with the early childhood um, curriculum, and it really supports um, the things that we learn from Learn, Grow, Go, and we will have an evaluation that goes with it as well that's more focused to the teacher, where we're asking for teacher perceptions on learning. All right, Wendy, that was like a lot. This is all of our, we're pretty active on social media, so follow us um, and check out the resources on the website because there is a lot of it. Yep. Yeah.
That okay. was that was fantastic. A whirlwind around. <laughs> so that, that to... was like a, around the world in an hour. But um, I hope it gave you guys kind of the I don't know the why the why because I I think that's really important. I mean, growing is so much fun for the kids and eating is fun for the kids, but. Th- you know, we've seen the outcomes and we want to get those kind of behavioral outcomes and changes for our children and family. And, and we've been able to see that through what, what's happened with Learn, Grow, Go. Right. It's, it's so fantastic. And that's what the main reason why I wanted to um, get everyone on the, on the training today exposed to it. And, you know, what blows me away is those aggregated numbers and those huge amount of surveys that you have and this just real uh, concerted effort and that we're not there yet in Florida. And I would really like to see us be able to, to, to uh, elevate to that level. So um, let's see. Um, I'll tell you, Wendy, on the, on the cooperative section of our um, website, mm-hmm. um, if you want to pull up our reports, they're there, our annual reports. So if you kind of want to read the whole thing and sort of see it, um, those are there. And I'll say we have helped a number of other states as they've got it started with their programming. So if that's something, you know, as you guys get going, you know, our team could come and help facilitate training if you feel like that would be helpful for you guys. Okay, well, we, yes, I th- the answer to that is yes, and it's, it's the timing, you know, as we get our feet back under us after COVID and keep, and keep plowing forward, but I think that's the goal that we really want to get to. So, um, folks, um, any questions uh, for Lisa while we have her? Linda? No, we can't. <laughs> okay. Um, Nope, still can't hear you, Linda. Daniel, what did you think of the day? Daniel always talks, so let's get him. Oh, (laughs) yeah, I thought it was, I think it is absolutely awesome. Um, As extension, I I think it's really important that, you know, we, the underlying theme across everything is agricultural literacy. And I think school gardens are a tremendous way to to really spark youth interest and get them understanding that if that you know the latest research says that one percent of the U.S. population feeds ninety nine percent, and in urban counties like Palm Beach, it's about 045 percent feeds you know ninety nine point six percent. So it's really important that we have an adequate understanding of those, you know of the 0.45 percent so anyway i thought it was an awesome presentation lisa it was awesome wendy it was great you know Good. um thank you thank you i think we've got linda can you hear me we can linda yay yes. miss lisa i've been so excited to speak to you if you need somebody to represent learn grow eat and go i'm your woman I've been doing this since February 2019 using your Learn, Grow, Eat, and Go, and I've been so excited, and I've been learning like a student. Um, I got a couple questions, though. On your, I had to make up my own thing, so don't laugh at me, but do you have poster boards or things that we can use like in lesson one for plants? Because I, I, I like to go back to the students each week and let them know what it is, and we go down the list, and I we speak about this. So I made my own plant things up. I have my own. Oh, that's awesome. I did my six basic plant parts and definitions. So then um, I could go back each week and we do a quick review so the students will know what it is. And then I, I make my own things up and I didn't know if you had anything. Look, Linda, we have some under teacher resources, like some like printable things and stuff like that, but it's been a lot of that, so I'm not sure um, exactly what all we have there, but I know that there are some that are, that can be PDF or printables that, that could be used in the classroom or for instruction. And, and Miss Lisa, let me tell you, um, I've been using these at first, I was getting them, I would go into Home Depot 
and I don't think I could steal anymore. So now I had to um, purchase them. And then I realized you can't use normal markers. You have to use the 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 ones that so when it rains you don't want it to all the children's work permanent to markers so yeah so i need to make sure i bought enough permanent markers now so and then that uh, just another little tidbit when you were talking about those paper towel holders i used it on one of my um garden beds and the harvest was not good at all I, you need to buy thin cheap paper towels so just a just a little uh, tidbit to help other help other people if they're going to do that right. lesson. Um, I absolutely love all the books that go in with with the lessons. I think your garden journal books are the best. I love the five taste testings. The students look forward for me to bring the foods in. So I really enjoy that. Um, but I realize that there's a lot of miscellaneous papers. So what I made up here, um, I didn't know if you had anything. So I, I made up my own thing where they have so many, uh, they accumulate so many papers. So I just made their a portfolio. So that's what I added to your, with all your stuff to add with the portfolio because there's so many extra papers when you print everything out of yours so i just you know maybe we need, you... to, we need to put some of your resources that you've done linda <laughs> on our agent section of the website we have some agents well like during covid they put together um container garden kits that families could pick up from the school so they were learning at home i thought what a great idea and so she put together what she did and we're put so that is so helpful for others well when um i started i started your your program in in um learn grow eat and go in 2000 in February 2019 before COVID. And I was teaching in the classrooms like neighborhood centers, um, private schools, um, public schools, um, after school programs, during the school programs, and then everything changed because of COVID. And we had to do virtual Zoom. And I did do some in person. I even did outside, outside with the gardens when we built the garden beds and we were spread out. So um, we just had to do things a little bit differently. And when with your taste testing, instead of me just handing things out, I had to do extra work by putting things in like little containers and ramekins and so on and plastic bags. And I would hand that off to extended day coordinators, teachers, whomever. And your, your videos were a lifesaver in teaching this program during COVID. So thank you. Oh, I'm so happy. You know, and I feel like those videos are gonna be helpful even because a lot of the teachers love to show that as kind of an introduction to the lesson. So we had a lot that I'm so glad that we were helpful to you. I really enjoy doing, um, working on this. I'm, I'm new at this about a little over a year now, and I'm, I'm learning so much. And I'm really fortunate that I ha I work at the Orange County 4-H University of Florida, the IFAS program, and everybody is so helpful. And I absolutely love the curriculum that you're giving that's going to start in August of 2021 for the preschool. Back in Ohio, I was a lead teacher for five years for Head Start. How awesome, how exciting. Those little ones are going to go crazy doing that. You need, you're going to have to be the one helping to lead that <laughs> in Florida, you know? Yes, um, she is. <laughs> I'm sure y'all are like us. We have so many that work with preschool programs. So I'm excited to see what you guys, that's amazing. <laughs> Well, thank you. I was excited for you to come on. Everybody's been very helpful, but I've been working on your program for the past year and I just keep on learning. I, I'm a forever student and I just want to thank you. Well, not mine, it's ours. And, oh, and you know what? I just appreciate the work and those of us that work in extension this past year is year. And, and kudos for all that you do, because I, I know that we've all had to be able to, and, and right, be able to turn on the dime and the stuff that our county extension employees have done has been incredible to help, you know, continue to support it all. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, we all have to be cautious because you do learn, grow, eat, go. You get uh, enthusiastic like Linda. You get bit by the enthusiasm bug. So yes, we do nominate Linda to be our spokesperson. <laughs> and I wouldn't have met you if we hadn't done this in-service training, Linda. So I'm so thrilled that we did. 
Well, y'all, it's getting close to being five o'clock. I cannot thank you enough for hanging in there with us and learning and contributing and being uh, uh, attentive and also enhancing with the what you added as well. And to uh, Lisa, we cannot thank you enough for being here with us today and introducing this concept to us, showing us this curriculum and knowing that you are there to support us as we go forward with it as well. Yes. So, just let us know how we can help you guys as you go, as you get going. And and if y'all haven't signed up, we do a bi-weekly newsletter. Um, you can sign up, right? And there's a lot of things that we send out on that about upcoming events and trainings. And we do have a big new training that we do every year at the end of February. We're planning on offering it in person in 2021. Um, and we'll send out, in, or 2022, we'll send out information about that, but I know we'll have a pretty big focus on the curricula because that will be fairly new, so. Well, let me just say something because our Dean of Extension just uh, put a call out for mini grants, and um, that would be a great conference for you all to attend if you are interested in um, this curriculum to go out to, to go out to College Station and spend a couple days with Lisa and Randy and their team and get indoctrinated and find out all about it. So that would be a good mini grant of submission if you all were interested in that. So great. Well, be looking. We'll have information coming out. Um, later in the summer about you know all the specifics and, and the schedule and things for that so fantastic well y'all i'm going to sign off it's almost five o'clock we've been at it for almost eight hours so i appreciate it uh thank you and thank you lisa and thank you to all of our attendees um it's been a fantastic day appreciate it so much awesome. Take care. thanks everybody thank you bye-bye